Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Verticillium Stripe Workshop. My name is Kaylee Kondracic, and I'm the Agronomy Extension Specialist with SAS Canola. We're so happy that you're able to join us today to learn of the advancements in research that have been made for Verticillium Stripe disease. Uh, we've got a few housekeeping items before the presentations. So continuing education credits are available for certified crop advisors. To earn credits, please send us your full name and CCA number in the chat box. We will fill in the sign-in sheet and send it to the appropriate person for you. Our presentations today are pre-recorded. If anyone has questions during the presentations, you may type them in the Q&A box. Please specify which presenter your question is for. Our presenters may choose to answer some of them as we go, but we will also have a live 30-minute Q&A session at the end of all the presentations. During the presentation, you will be muted so that there will be no feedback that will interfere with the audio. We encourage you to use the chat box to add to the discussion. Uh, you can start now. Uh, tell us your name and where you farm or work. And this webinar is also being recorded and the link will be emailed out to you at a later date. So with that, we will get started with a few words from Doug Heath, the research manager with SAS Canola. Hello everyone, I'm Doug Heath the research manager for SAS Canola. Today's Verticillium Stripe workshop is funded by the Canadian Agricultural Partnership Program, including funding and the contributions from AAFC, the Canola Council of Canada, Alberta Canola, and SAS Canola through the Canola Cluster. Verticillium was only recently discovered in Canada in 2014, and we are now understanding the risks to canola production. More work is needed to understand Verticillium longisporum, the pathogen that causes Verticillium Stripe in canola, and how it impacts yields in Western Canada. The goal of today's workshop is to give an overview of the latest research into this pathogen and its interactions with canola and other canola pathogens, as well as knowledge for how to manage it in your fields. And for canola producers and agronomists, there are free testing programs in some provinces. So in Manitoba, MCGA offers several free disease testing services for Manitoba canola growers through the PSI lab, including for verticillium stripe. And other provincial canola commissions may offer testing programs in the future, so stay connected. Several commercial diagnostic labs also offer verticillium stripe testing as a fee for service. And more information on many of today's research projects that are being presented can be found on the Canola Research Hub. This interactive research database was also developed as part of the CAP Canola Cluster and provides summaries of, of canola research across Canada on many different topics. And as a side note for Saskatchewan, SAS Canola encourages Saskatchewan farmers to sign up with the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture to allow crop specialists onto their land to, sur to survey for crop diseases. This data is used for monitoring and early warning of outbreaks for the benefit of all farmers. Uh, so this morning, we're going to have five presentations followed by a QA session. To start the session, we'll hear from Justine Cornelson to give us an agronomist's perspective on verticillium. And this will be followed by two CAP canola cluster presentations. One from Delantha Fernando from the U of M will we'll speak on the disease etiology, including factors such as spore longevity in the soil and genetic diversity of the pathogen. The second one will, will be from Hussein Borhan from AAFC Saskatoon, who will talk on genetics and genomics of the Brassica verticillium interaction. And the fourth presentation today will be from Becky Wang from the U of A to give us an overview of the typical yield losses under different inoculum pressures. And finally, we have an international guest speaker who is Jasper De Potter from the University of Cologne to talk about the genetic evolution of verticillium pathogens. And a little bit later on in the workshop, a CCA credit QR code will be displayed. But for now, I'd like to welcome Justine Cornelson to start off the workshop. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Justine Cornelson agronomic and regulatory services manager with Brett Young Seeds uh, and an agronomist here in Manitoba and, and that's actually what today I'm going to talk about is just my experience with verticillium stripe, um, you know, how I've been able to identify it in the field and, and provide tips for other agronomists um, on how to properly diagnose verticillium stripe. 
Um, first off, I really like to thank SAS Canola for the invitation um, and for having this workshop. I see lots of value in, in understanding this disease and I'm super excited to learn more uh, about some of the exciting research that we have going on here within Canada and, and globally as well, hearing from Dr. De Potter. So to start things off, I'm obviously one of the first speakers of the day. It's always good to introduce, you know, what we're actually working with and talking about. Um, so we are working with the pathogen Verticillium longisporum. It is a soil-borne fungi uh, causing vascular diseases within plant host species. Um, typically, this is found within brassica hosts. So this is why we talk a lot about um, canola and, and Verticillium longisporum. Um, it is typically more pathogenic on brassica hosts in comparison to some other Verticillium uh, species. Species. Uh, one species that we, we work with here in Canada quite frequently is, is Verticillium dahlia. Uh, this is something that we, we uh, had dealt with for quite some time. Uh, we see it in our potato crops and our sunflower crops, so we know this species is here. Um, as for the actual disease that Verticillium longisporum causes within uh, canola um, is, is Verticillium stripe. And, and we've had a few different name changes, which I'll talk about, um, but we've gone with Verticillium stripe because it, it causes symptoms of, of stem stripping um, or stem striping, where the, the symptoms are not so much like the wilt symptoms that are seen elsewhere. Uh, we're seeing uh, unilateral uh, striping, we're seeing really fragile stalks. And, and so that's why we've gone with the, the name and the disease here in canola uh, called verticillium stripe. Uh, so far we know that it is a, a monocyclic disease so it only continues um, or this particular uh, pathogen is only able to fulfill one life cycle so we're only seeing the disease typically move in later within our growing season. So to further understand what we're working with, uh, the Canola Council Canada has developed a really um, valuable disease life cycle. Um, so if, if we're able to, or if we're going to walk through the steps here, um, it's good to understand how this particular um, pathogen enters into the plants and then how it then eventually causes disease. And so within the soil, this is a soil-borne disease, we're able to find the Uh The Mycolosclerotia are, are going to um, either be living in old or decaying um, plants stubble or, or living freely within the soil. From there, they're able to seek out um, the roots of, of brassica plants and then they're taken up into the plant by the root. Uh, from there, they'll move up through um, through through the xylem into the stem and and that's really the area that we're really concerned about with this particular disease is the damage is caused in the stem so from there this is where um, uh, when once this uh, pathogen starts to really colonize and start working away on the on the plant material um, it's going to start to inhibit the in or the, the, uh, the flow of nutrients and, and water up into that plant and, and that's where eventually we see these plants start to collapse right they've got decaying material um, that's no no longer able to to function and provide the proper nutrients to this uh, plant. When we go to harvest canola or once those plants decay within the field, um, all of the Mycolosclerotia that have developed within that decaying plant material have now then been released back into the soil. So this is how this particular pathogen continues on its life cycle. Um, there's still a lot of unknowns and, and we're going to hear about it later today on some of the research to understand, you know, what is the, the longevity of, of Mycolosclerotia here within our soils, um, you know, how, what can be done to protect that st uh, stem material, what conditions, environmental conditions, um, are, uh, is this particular uh, pathogen going to thrive in? And, and, and same goes for the disease. So lots of information that we're still trying to figure out. And like I said, it, it, it'll be exciting to hear more and, and hopefully we'll be able to develop some management practices from that. So to provide some background on, on this particular pathogen here in Canada, um, it was first identified in Manitoba in 2014 on a research farm just outside of Winnipeg. So this was the first DNA case um, of Verticillium longisporum in Canada. So new disease to Canada, but not a brand new or pathogen by any means. Uh, this is a particular pathogen and disease that we do see in other uh, production regions for canola. Uh, so mainly Europe, um, that's been a, a well established disease and pathogen there for quite some time. Uh, in, in 2015, that's when CFIA completed a really extensive survey all across Canada looking for Verticillium longisporum, and they were able to identify it in six provinces through DNA testing. 
uh, in, in 2018 and 2019, and if we can try to uh, rewind and, and think back to those particular years, we had delayed harvest, and, and especially in Manitoba. Um, we had um, disease symptoms that were extremely noticeable and, and not something that we'd been really familiar with working with. Um, I had complaints from growers saying it was wrapping around their reels um, when they were going to harvest, really dark stems, really fragile, so sounding a lot like sclerotinia, but dark in color. Um, and, and then if we think to, to 2020, which I know that seems like eons ago with the roller coaster ride we've been on, uh, but in 2020 and 2021 were our, our drought years. Um, so right, we're in this drought cycle and, and this is where the disease really become a lot more noticeable and early on in the season. We were able to identify symptoms extremely early. And, and in Manitoba in particular, um, going and, and completing the Manitoba Canola Disease Survey, which is um, uh, uh, run through Manitoba of agriculture um, through their surveyed fields over 30 percent of the fields were showing symptoms for verticillium um, and, and upwards of 15 percent incidence within these fields um, so we we know it's here in manitoba and we know it's actually quite widespread um, across the prairies when we start to look for it um, there's a lot of suspect fields that we're finding in saskatchewan and a few in alberta as well um, but not as predominant as we've seen it within manitoba and if you look at any disease serving um, information we've seen verticillium every year to seem to really creep up likely because we're able to actually diagnose it and maybe favorable conditions where we've seen sclerotinia trend the other way and actually really increase or decrease where we haven't seen much of it at all um, due to these uh, last few years of drought. My first real experience with working with verticillium stripe was actually the year I moved back from Manitoba. I had been in Alberta and, and hadn't been able to find it there, but uh, I was completing a, a Manitoba canola disease survey. So I was in the field surveying um, this particular field. Um, it was actually up in the St. Rose area and I was there early um, or what I would consider early for the area around mid August where the field had already uh, just been swathed. Um, and it was laid down in a swath because it had so much premature ripening going on. Um, there was plants lodging, there was shelling out, um, and it was kind of like a pathologist dream. There was anything and everything in there. Uh, there was loads of sclerotinia, it was on a wet year. Uh, there was also a lot of black leg in the field as well. Um, so whatever, I, I'd done my, my sampling and, and um, continued on my merry way. And, and for some reason, I was back about a month later. And I, I think I was honestly there to collect a bunch of black leg residue because there was so much going on. And um, I had noticed something else that was um, becoming more are uh, quite evident within the standing stubble. And if you draw your eye into the, these few stems of the front here, um, there was this grayish um, discoloration going on. And, and when you were pulling these plants out of the ground, um, they would actually shred and just crumble with it when you pulled. Um, very, very fragile. And, and like I said, they weren't bleached. They weren't um, completely white. Um, there was no sclerotia bodies in these particular plants. Um, so this was my first kind of little hint and clue towards, uh, hey, I might be dealing with something else here. And uh, when we got the plant samples back, it end up, ended up being uh, verticillium stripe. Um, through that year and 20, I guess it would have been 2017 into 2018, 19 area, um, I was able to pull quite a few more plants and, and able to, like I said, find this all across Manitoba through my, my surveying efforts. Um, and, and you can see here, we're now we're starting to get some symptomology happening. Um, I was able to pull out key uh, features of, of, the, of the pathogen's life cycle and able to find those microscrotia. Um, so you can see the microscrotia here in the zoomed version. Um, that a lot of these plants were pulled late in the season, so not at that typical canola disease surveying time. Uh, you can see here these plants had been out in the field for quite some time, um, starting to really degrade. You can see how shred, uh, how much they're shredding and how fragile they really are. In 2018, I had started my master's uh, looking at uh, major gene differences on black leg. Um, so I was in fields quite frequently, and, and this particular site just outside of Nipawa along Highway 16 really stood out to me. Um, I was, was in there at, you know, right prior to harvest, doing my stem cuttings, raiding black leg, um, and I had a lot of this graying discoloration show up, which was making my, my ratings extremely difficult to do. Um, and, and this was a field that I was able to then follow along and really watch the disease progress within these plants. 
I would consider this an iconic photo. It's a photo that we use quite frequently. Um, but it, this is, the, like I said, one of the, the first times really working with this disease and understanding it. So uh, this image was taken at the time I was doing black light rating, so right, right prior to harvest. Um, and you can see this, this starburst or this gray discoloration that's happening, grayish brown, in comparison to, to something like black light or a healthy plant with no no diseases at the time and um, above ground there wasn't a lot of, of symptoms showing um, right there's a, maybe a bit of a discoloration here but you can see in the black leg plant we're seeing that as well um, so, so nothing really above ground and um, at this particular field I was able to follow it through um, every you know week I stopped by to really watch this and so I would marked plants and, and things I'd kind of you know suspected to have verticillium and eventually over time was able to see uh, the microscrotia within the field. From from all my fields, from my master's work, I, I collected plant samples, and in this, um, these samples were from the that Nipawa field. Um, but I picked samples uh, based on being hopefully just black leg, and and I didn't want other pathogens to take over and colonize. So these uh, plant samples sat in in the lab for a few months um, in a dry area, um, and when I opened them up to work with them, um, uh, Verticillium longiform had colonized a lot of the tissue. So it made trying to isolate black leg off of this extremely difficult. You can see the, the microscrotia and how they've grown all throughout that inner, inner stem um, and, and the plant has become hollow. So like I said, first real experience of, of working with this and it brought up so many other questions. And, and to me, the, the first big one was the environment. You know, what is creating this? What, what conditions are, are causing this pathogen to take off? With some very different um, kind of growing seasons that we'd experienced, right, we've gone from some really wet ones with delayed harvest to some really hot and dry. Um, so some mixed factors there. Uh, I was wanting to, you know, dive into the literature to understand the environment that this particular um, uh, pathogen requires and, and how this disease can then thrive. And, and a lot of the work was showing that this particular uh, disease uh, really thrives in hot, dry conditions. Um, so a lot of the, the work, like I said, has been done over in Europe, um, which shows actually warmer soil temperatures really increase that colonization of, of verticillium longisporum and, and typically b b before flowering um, and, and so that's what we think is happening here right it, it probably comes in right before flowering um, and, and it's and not it's we, because we've got a shorter growing season it's not a long enough period of time to allow that pathogen to get up into the stem to really start to colonize and, and create infection there um, but like I said, that's that's speculation we're still trying to figure that out so um, but we're, we're seeing like I said, in the literature that it, it does thrive in these hot, dry temperatures, and, and that's something we have been experiencing um, across the prairie region. This was a field uh, from 2020, so uh, think back, it was a, a really hot, dry summer as well. This was taken in the Verdon area where I'm from, um, where we had very little precipitation that summer, uh, pretty well nothing throughout July and, and August. And you can see um, that the field we've got, um, it's lodging, there's areas that are falling down already, um, some premature ripening. And, and this was actually a, a cultivar trial and, and the cultivar next to it was actually standing a lot better. Um, so we were really focused focusing in on what was going on and if you were to stick your head in the canopy uh, this is what we were seeing and, and you know below ground uh, well we're seeing lots of drought like symptoms where we've got lots of leaf decay uh, but I see a lot of beige stems and, and to me when I see that I would think, oh those are sclerotinia plants but we had no like I said no precipitation low humidity all summer um, so there wasn't the, the white mold growing there was no sclerotia bodies and um, when you started to actually look at these plants and, and pull them up um, there was maybe a little bit of grayish hue starting to form within the root but there wasn't a lot of obvious verticillium symptoms. It was near the end of August when we were looking at this field, uh, so plants were, were starting to ripen, um, but we were seeing these really mild symptoms that were starting to point me more towards verticillium and um, up in some of the higher branches, and this is the first time I had started, or that I'd really noticed um, verticillium up that high was the development of microscrotia on some of the side branches. So you can see here in the one image we've got just a, a 
tiny, tiny little branch or broken off branch where the microscrotia were starting to develop. We were getting a lot of that half stem senescence. So you can see here the plants on the ground. We've got our green, healthy looking ones. Um, then we've got these kind of beige, discolored looking plants um, where they were having that half stem senescence. And you can actually see where the pods were already starting to shell out. Um, so like I said, mild symptoms uh, following up with this field a few weeks later. Um, verticillium was much easier to find. You're able to see the, the microscrotia and a lot of that um, uh, stem tissue. The number one question I get in the field is, you know, what type of, of yield damage does this cause? Um, and in any of the work that we're seeing out of Europe, uh, the, the the losses are variable. Um, and if you do have uh, microscrotia development present and, and stem senescence happening at the time of harvest, you know, there could be yield reductions of upwards of 30 to 50%. Um, a lot of the work shows that the, the losses are typically insignificant or, or also very inconsistent and, and it comes down to the environment, right? So that important part of the disease triangle and then, you know, are there the environmental conditions there for that particular disease to thrive in? Uh, there hasn't been any really reports of um, any negative impacts to seed quality, which is a really important thing to note. Um, here in Canada, we think the pathogen just comes in too late in the season to really cause an impact. Um, this might be why we see um, potentially losses or claims of losses when we have crops that are harvested later into September um, or that have been in the field for, for a long time. We are finding these severe symptoms typically later on in the season. Uh, so that's a kind of a, a positive thing to note, uh, right? We don't see these really aggressive or the, the development of microscrotia until later on in the season. Um, and, and thankfully that should hopefully be reducing our overall um, yield impact seen by this particular disease. I've already gone over quite a few um, of the plant uh, symptoms that we're seeing or key kind of diagnostic features, uh, but I do want to go back over and, and, and go through it in a little more detail just to really help train the eye of what we are looking for. Um, some of these things that are listed here on the screen, uh, we might not actually find in the field. Uh, some of them are much easy, easier to identify within the greenhouse setting. Uh, something like any of the leaf uh, symptoms, I find very difficult to identify in the field and I haven't been able to say, oh, I think this is going to be verticillium a, a few months later or a few weeks later um, and we've dealt with some dry years so the leaves already don't look all that great so just little things like that um, I think it's important to to kind of know what to be looking for at different parts throughout the growing season and on different um, components of the plant. Like I said, here's just some of the stem senescence um, or senescing. Um, to me in the past I most likely would have diagnosed this as sclerotinia um, right, we, we can have waves of sclerotinia come in on those wet, humid years, and then it turns dry later on, so you don't see the white mold growing, um, so you get these bleached, really fragile stems. Um, you, eventually, when you crack them open, you'll find that sclerotia body where we're just not seeing that with the verticillium plants, right? We see the microsclerotia once you peel back that outer, outer stem wall. Um, and, and this is a tough canopy image, but you can see uh, where we've got green plants, healthy plants, and then these beige discoloration. And typically this is half, happening on a half stem level. So early on, this is the symptom you're going to see is where it's only colonizing half of the stem as it grows up into the canopy. The same, just uh, another um, kind of zoomed in image. Here's higher up in the in the plant where you can see same. It's still at that half stem. So all the stems on the, on the infected half are have gone um, bleached or discolored as well. Uh, this is very very similar to drought. Uh, to me, these symptoms look a lot alike. Where you've got this dry down, um, this bleached or discoloration occurring. Uh, typically with drought, you won't get it on half of the plant. Um, and like I said, here's just the full plant, so you can see it here where these. Uh, particular branches are, are starting to shell out as well um, and that they've all gone brown where the other half of the plant is still remaining green. Uh, assessing or looking for verticillium within the root tissue hasn't been a, a key diagnostics feature. It, it's something over time in the field that we've started to notice and, and make note of and, and sure enough it, it keeps coming back as verticillium longisporum but this grayish discoloration, um, same you can cut low down on the root or you can move up where you do a typical black leg rating right at the base of the plant um, and if you're seeing this grayish hue or this brownish kind of starburst pattern uh, you might even be able to see the, the microscrotia developing as well. So this is something that I find is, is quite easy for agronomists to identify in the field. Uh, this was a, actually a, a 
I shouldn't say a new symptom, but something uh, this particular year in 2021 that was a lot more obvious. And uh, in Manitoba, dry all summer, and then we had, gosh, it was like five to seven inches of rain middle of August. Um, so we weren't seeing a lot of above ground symptoms for verticillium at the time, uh, but below ground, the roots were really showing themselves. And, and this would have been, gosh, I think this was first week in September. Uh, the, the field was actually getting harvested that particular day. Um, the, the outer root uh, wall was shedding or sloughing right off of, of the root. Um, and once it sloughed off, it revealed a bunch of microsclerotia. And, and same, if you were to cut these plants, they were starting to show the grayish hue. Um, and you can see here, this green healthy plant uh, in comparison to the stubble or the stem above ground that was starting to really sh decay and eventually show the microsclerotia. But like I said, there was a bit of a, a delay this year in, in seeing microsclerotia up into the canopy and up into those stems. Um, so to me, the, the really defining characteristic of a properly identifying verticillium in the field is finding the, the microsclerotia. And same, you might not find them earlier on, but come back a few weeks later, and, and that's where they become a lot more evident. Uh, you can see in this particular plant, we've got uh, the green, right, the half stems in essence, so half of the plant still is green and looks great, where the other half has got that bleach discoloration, very, very fragile. As soon as you start to rip back that outer stem wall, that's where you start to see all the microsclerotia. And, and this example here um, really shows it, right? On the outside, I would have probably considered this to be a sclerotinia plant. And um, like I said, just if you peel back, you're starting to see that grayish discoloration in these tiny, tiny uh, microsclerotia throughout. So as for management, um, it, it looks a little grim right now. Uh, being a new disease, right, we just don't have the tools in place to, to properly manage this quite yet. Uh, we've got a few, um, I guess, tools there that are we use in all of our integrated pest management approaches. Um, but like I said, it, it is grim right now, and, and that's why um, having research underway here in Canada is so extremely important and valuable. Um, from there, we'll be able to better understand uh, what we're working with and then how we can hopefully better manage it. Um, so right now there, there's no preventative or curative um, of fungicides of any kind. Um, there's no foliar applications. You can't seed treat anything at the moment. Um, when we start to look to our overall IPM approaches, right, just managing brassica weeds, this is a brassica disease, so um, good weed control is going to help uh, minimize the amount of noculum going back into the field. Um, like I said, that's something that we see in all of ours. Uh, same with crop rotation. Um, from the literature, we know that these, these microsclerosia will likely live in the soil for quite a long time. Uh, so similar to something like that of club root, where those so the spores or the microsclerosia are going to stay there um, for, for a considerable amount of time within the soil, right? And in every time we grow a host crop, we run that potential of, of incre increasing the inoculum if the environment is right. Um, right now, um, we don't have um, a system in place to um, rate resistant hybrids. Um, it's something that uh, the industry is working towards. Um, when you look at trials that are got infected with verticillium, um, you can see differences. So we're just trying to working that through. Um, we're going to hear, like I said, we're going to hear some work today that's going to understand or look at understanding this better. So it is something that that is in motion, and hopefully within a few years we'll have some hybrids that are tolerant or resistant to um, verticillium longisporum. Um, and just one last thing, and this is a tough one in, in my experience uh, with working with this pathogen, is it's going to be tough to, to manage it um, via a sanitation or through a biosecurity plan. Uh, just based on when we harvest canola and that we're actually cutting right through the inoculum source. So when we're cutting stems, we're releasing all of these microsclerotia out into the environment. So from there, they're going to travel on the combines, they're going to blow in the wind, they're going to move very, very easily. And, and this is like I said, likely why we see it all across Manitoba already. Um, so we've just, we're really at the point of just proper diagnostics. And, and I think we're there. We've got enough information to understand and, and how to um, identify it within the field. So like I said, lots of tips going back through um, just understanding the difference. You know, sclerotinia and verticillium look a lot alike. They've got those beige, really fragile, um, shredding stems. But verticillium will reveal the microsclerotia once they, uh, or once you do shred off that outer stem wall. 
at verticillium in comparison to black leg. Um, like I said, the, the kind of uh, key diagnostic features is looking for those microscorotia versus the pycnidia within black leg. Um, same with the cross-section cuts, you can look then for the, the black discoloration versus that grayish hue or eventually microscrotia within the tissue as well. Um, so when you see them side by side, it's, it's a lot easier to, to diagnose and, and see the differences between the two. Same, here's just um, more of my hand modeling career, but um, you, right, you can see here the difference is um, very, quite um, obvious here when you see them side by side, right? So the, that grayish hue versus the black predominant spots and, and these plants here are actually showing the stem cankering or the cankers from, from left and gray maculins. And one more just for good measure, but of course, then you're going to find uh, plants that have a combination of diseases. So uh, we do see a lot of uh, verticillium longisporum uh, with uh, a black leg causing species. So either Leptospheria maculans or, or big lobosa. Management for this disease uh, might be slim right now, but we're, we're moving in the right direction. And I wanted to highlight two resources where um, a lot of the, the information that I've shared today um, and for sure the research that you're going to hear about can be all found on. And, and that first resource is uh, the Canola Re Research Hub. Um, so the, the projects from uh, the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, um, along with the Canola Agronomic Research Program, um, they'll all be held on, on the hub. Um, and then if you want to go check out the canola encyclopedia that's the second resource and on there there's a specific page dedicated all to verticillium um, so all of that verticillium stripe information can be found there and, and both of these resources are um, housed on on the canola council of canada's website since 2014, when, when this pathogen was first identified, um, we've learned a lot since then. Um, we've gained a lot of information and we've got actually quite a few great research projects underway, um, but there's still lots of unknowns. And, um, you know, these are kind of questions that, you know, maybe we might get answers from today, but if not, maybe in, in future research projects. And one thing that the industry is working on and, and a big question that we see at the field level is, you know, what is the severity? How can we rate the severity, um, right? We have different severity scales for for sclerotinia and black leg and club root um, and, and this is something that we're currently still missing for verticillium um, and, and like I said if it is going to continue to increase like we are seeing it in, in, in Manitoba in these dry years it's something that we do want to be able to rate properly and, and when you've got a rating scale in place from there you can then assess um, what that yield loss or penalty might be and, and like I said that is the biggest question coming from growers right now is you know what sort of losses can I expect from this disease and then their second question question is what can I do to manage it um, right this is something where um, we, we don't have a lot of tools yet um, I'm very uh, hopeful and, and and know they'll be coming eventually but you know how soon becomes the question um, right we, we're still at that point of understanding and, and really diving into the disease epidemiology um, but once we've got a better understanding of, of this disease and the pathogen itself um, and that interaction with canola hopefully then we can apply some some new tools uh, to better manage it and, and reduce the severity of it on these maybe what would can be considered good years for the disease like these hot dry seasons so um, and that kind of comes back to the last question is really I guess honing in on on where or what conditions um, it does or allow this pathogen to thrive in um, you know and, and same coming back to management what can we do in these years where we know it's going to really take off so like I said, lots of things in, in research. Um, it always poses more questions. And like I said, I'm, I'm excited to watch this file grow and develop and then hopefully have tools for, for growers to use um, in the near future. Thank you all for your time for today and, and thanks for joining this workshop. Like I said, I think there's huge value in, in having a group get together and really talk um, talk about this particular disease. So um, I will be around for the question period um, and, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of uh, the presentations today. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Saskanola, for inviting me to give a presentation on the research that we have been doing on managing verticillium stripe disease. As you know, it's an emerging threat to Canadian canola, and it's a must to do research to investigate how we can, we can mitigate this pathogen. Now, before I get started, I will be um, doing the indigenous land acknowledgement of University of Manitoba. 
The University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Now, as I mentioned, this disease is new. Uh, it was first identified in Manitoba in 2014. Uh, now, I have also put a question. Is it really a new disease? Because when the CFIA went and looked for soil samples to look for the pathogen or the DNA of the pathogen, it was found almost everywhere uh, in Alberta, British Columbia, Manitoba, Ontario, and Saskatchewan. Keep in mind, we don't grow too much of canola in British Columbia and Ontario, but yet the pathogen was found in those places as well. So <clears throat> I will have a few other slides to showcase the disease itself, so I'll move to that. So you can see that the inoculum that uh, would stay in the soil is right here. That is the pathogen's microsclerotia formation. Now, sclerotia or microsclerotia are minute mycelial fragments come together. So you can see these black dots everywhere on a uh, uh, stem that was infected by uh, verticillium. So that's going to be the issue that will take you to the next, uh, 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 next uh, season when the pathogen is there. So another important part that we need to remember is the pathogen can cause disease on the whole plant. Uh, the plant, dead, uh, plant can be dead, dieback can be seen, early senescence, stunting. Now leaves, the, uh, you will see that there's chlorosis, necrotic areas, abnormal colors, and abnormal leaf fall and wilting. Now when it comes to the stems, you'll see that stunting or rosset dieback, internal discoloration and blackening as microsclerotia appear. So those are the pictures that I've shown that uh, this is a very good picture to show you how much of microsclerotia can form on just one piece of stem. Now here's stem senescing. So I'll go through this very quickly because Justine has already shown you some of these in her presentation. And uh, this is what you will see after post, uh, this is after harvest, and this is in St. Rose, Manitoba, pictures taken in 2016. So here I also wanted to show you that verticillium stripe disease and, uh, and black leg are fairly looking similar, but they are different. You can see, so because of that, I have put them side by side for you to see that the black leg pathogen on the right hand side, uh, the pycnidia and pseudothesial formation will be much more pronounced than the microsclerotia forming on the stems with verticillium stripe disease. Because we have both the pathogens here in Canada, uh, this is an important part, mainly because the farmers are still getting used to verticillium stripe and they may misidentify uh, that to black leg or black leg uh, situations can be misidentified uh, with verticillium. So one of the other things that I will address at the genome level later is also important to be kept in mind as we move along. That is the evolutionary history of the verticillium. Now you can see that uh, species A and D uh, were initially coming together to create the lineage A1, D1, and uh, mixing with the Daliae with D2 uh, gave A1, D2, and verticillium dalii D3 lineage with A1 gave A1 D3. So these have given rise to the longisporum lineage. So they can be A1 D1, A1 D2, or A1 D3. So let's see how, as we move along, how what we see. Now, just to give you a, <clears throat> another bit of a, uh, understanding and advice, we, we have found that verticillium dalii can also cause verticillium uh, stripe disease. And you will find verticillium uh, dalii in some places, especially in Alberta. 
and uh, also Ontario. Now, uh, in Manitoba, we have predominantly found uh, verticillium longisporum. And here's a few more pictures in the greenhouse, how uh, plants could be stunted when uh, the pathogen has impacted the, uh, with the pathogen. Uh, here's Vesta, a normal uh, control with water, and here the pathogen has been inoculated, so you'll see severe stunting. So again, what is really happening in the plant is something that we need to be looking at in the future. That's part of the CAP project uh, that I'm uh, planning to uh, emphasize and put forward to understand whether there are enzymes that are being restricted and whether there are certain uh, physiological changes that are happening because of the verticillium longisporum. So these are gene expression studies that will lead us to understand the pathogen better. And you can see the uh, pathogen here again, and the pathogen spores are shown here. Now, uh, I think I have a slide to show uh, Dalii and longisporum side by side, and in that you will see that the longisporum uh, spores are much larger than the Dalii spores. So uh, initially, when we first came to be allowed to work on verticillium, there was a, a period that there were restrictions by CFIA for any researcher to work on verticillium. And once that was lifted, my uh, uh, postdoc at the time, Dr. Zhong Wei Zhou, looked at the uh, verticillium longisporum isolates that we had been able to identify and isolate from Manitoba. And to make a long story short, what I'm showing here is that uh, verticillium longisporum that was isolated in Manitoba all belonged to the A1D1. That was the uh, predominant one that was found. So this is the slide that shows it. So isolates recovered from mustard was confirmed to be Dalii. Uh, all the ones that we got from canola and radish were categorized as the A1D1 lineage of verticillium longisporum. Now, I've already given a little bit of the work that uh, Dr. Zhongwei Zhou did, uh, my research associate, but since then we have expanded the research to uh, with a CAP project that we uh, got in 2018 uh, with uh, first Dr. Fei Liu, uh, and after he left the program, uh, Dr. Arya Dolabatanian working uh, with uh, me on this particular pathogen and looking at c uh, several areas of research that I will be presenting shortly. And Justine Cornelson, who was a master's student at the time, was also very uh, helpful to us by collecting, because she is a field person, she goes to the fields, talks to the farmers, collects the samples, and brings over uh, the, the most important part for a plant pathologist, that is the stubble that is infected. So that's what she was doing, and uh, this was very helpful for our program. So again, uh, a recent publication that came from our program um, is having this new verticillium disease cycle. So I would uh, highly encourage you to look at this particular uh, paper that is published in the Canadian Journal of Plant Pathology in 2021, and the uh, first author's name is Arya Dolopatanian. And here we show clearly the pathway of the disease cycle of the verticillium stripe. And I will let you take uh, into account once you see this video later, uh, how this pathogen uh, moves uh, into the next season. Now, what are the challenges with this pathogen and disease? What's not known about verticillium stripe? So this is an important question that I would like to ask, and I would uh, ask you to be thinking about these as we move along. So one of it is there's been no characterization of host resistance in canola varieties to verticillium longisporum. The variation among verticillium isolates are there other than A1D1 lineage in Canada? That has not been looked at. No knowledge on the spatial distribution of the pathogen in soils. That's something to be worked into. No knowledge on the survivability of the pathogen in soil. That has to be looked into. Not enough information on the genome and genes. So we have started to work on that as well. 
no knowledge on stage of canola crop that is most susceptible. We have done that as well. So here I'm very uh, pleased to uh, announce that all these six areas have been very thoroughly studied by my group and we have some fantastic results to share with uh, you and thanks to Saskanola's uh, program under the CAP funding for funding this work. So I will go through these steps of the burial study to understand the longevity of verticillium longisporum in soil, look at the dispersal study looking at how pathogen disperses, look at a germplasm study to test uh, and uh, screen varieties of genotypes that are in Canada from seed uh, companies and isolate uh, uh, and look at what we have isolated, what lineages they belong to. So again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. All that I wanted to mention was there were different burial depths that we were targeting, 5, 10, 15, and 20 centimeters, and sampling times have been up to 36 months after burial. So here's the bad news. The pathogen survives longer than we thought. Now we know that sclerotia can survive long, but we thought at least at the uh, level of uh, different depths, there will be microbial activity good enough to bring down the pathogen population. But all the samples that we isolated and the soil DNA uh, that we worked into looking uh, for the verticillium longisporum gave the bands for the verticillium longisporum specific uh, primers. So that means the pathogen is still there. Now the next step is to isolate these uh, microorganisms that are on the uh, microsclerotia and in the soil to further investigate whether there are any antagonism and antagonistic organisms that we can use in the future. That again will go into our CAP project that we will be uh, uh, looking uh, for submitting in 20, uh, this year. So you can see the pathogen growing. Here's the inoculum on the stubble and here's the uh, burial places. We put the uh, microsclerotia uh, embedded uh, stems into mesh bags so that we can easily pick them from any depth and we had put these uh, uh, flags so that it was easy to go and identify. So they would stay uh, for the whole winter and then we will uh, monitor throughout uh, as we move along. Looking at the dispersal study, now that also had some very interesting uh, findings. So what we did was we put inoculum right in the middle in a virgin soil. Virgin meaning we had uh, done extensive DNA sampling to see whether the verticillium was present and nowhere could we find the verticillium in this particular patch of a 60 meter by 60 meter area. So once we knew that, we had put the stubble right in the center so that we know we can then monitor the progression of the pathogen across the soil, across the uh, growing season. And that's what we have done with different steps that are shown here. So uh, we collect the stubble and then we look for the pathogen. So to make a long story short, um, we were able to do a Duncan's grouping for the mean uh, appearance and the disease severity in different uh, parts of that uh, field and make predictions as to how far the pathogen has moved. So again, I'm not going into a lot of detail here because of time, but you can see that the pathogen, uh, if you look at uh, the areas uh, looking at east, north, south, and west here, uh, they are being uh, uh, moving at different levels. You can see one meter eight weeks after sowing, uh, two meters eight weeks after sowing, and two meters two weeks after sowing. So at different times, we have been able to get different inoculum levels and the pathogen's presence when we uh, try to isolate the pathogen and do DNA sampling. So <clears throat> now comes to the most important part in my uh, 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 thoughts or in mitigating this disease, to screen canola lines with lo verticillium longisporum. Now, I thank the seed companies that have participated, and I would en encourage other seed companies to participate because this would really help you to understand what are your varieties and cultivars and germplasm and elite lines that might be having some resistance to verticillium longisporum. 
So using resistant cultivars is the most effective and environmentally friendly method to control this disease. Uh, screening this uh, resistant germplasm in canola is an effective way to broaden resistant sources in current varieties. That would be the work of breeders once we know the resistance. And seeking new resistant sources from different geographical regions such as China should be an effective method to broaden our breeding resources against this pathogen as well. So today I'm not presenting that part of the work, but just to let you know in brief, we have found some excellent resistance in the Chinese germplasm. But here, showing the uh, work that we did with seed companies, here's germplasm uh, uh, that we have put uh, in Portage La Prairie. This is at the reproductive stage, and I have a uh, picture in Kelburn Farm uh, with the vegetative stage. So the same varieties, same lines went into both uh, locations. We had some Czech varieties such as Vesta and others that are susceptible to make the uh, determination. So here's the screening of Chinese uh, lines that we did as well. <clears throat> so looking for that resistance was an important part. You can see that there are some plants. This is uh, Vesta that is quickly uh, succumbing to the Verticillium longisporum, whereas some others are really well and good. Now, uh, the flowering times are uh, a little different for the uh, Chinese germplasm because it's a semi-winter, so you can see that on this side. Now, again, a few pictures to show uh, our work that we did with the Chinese lines, and you can see um, the severe infection with the uh, some of the Czech varieties, such as Vesta. There were other varieties uh, that were susceptible uh, that we had put as Czech varieties too. So how did we go about uh, making the uh, decisions on uh, whether it is susceptible or resistance? Here's a healthy plant uh, with uh, uh, no visible microsclerotia that was scored as a, a one. A single uh, colonization with uh, sorry, slight colonization with microsclerotia was scored as two. You can see the difference. And then as you move here, there's more microsclerotia, but which was scored as three, and then very strong uh, colonization uh, with microsclerotia that was scored as four. So you can also see the uh, field, uh, the stems, and uh, we have uh, cut them to show the differences that you can see. This is in Port Echelle Prairie. Uh, and this is in uh, Kelburn. Now, again, showing you uh, all these genotypes uh, in one, you can see Vesta in uh, 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 one of the locations. I think this was in Kelburn, and uh, this was in, uh, sorry, I think this was in Port Echelle Prairie, this was in Kelburn. And you can see that the Kelburn had uh, a perfect four for Vesta. And which means that when you uh, compare with a perfect four, which is super susceptible, and you see some of these varieties and lines that we had tested for different companies performing this well, that means that we are in good shape with most of the varieties. Now, what I don't know is whether these are varieties or germplasm uh, elite lines uh, from the seed companies because they are coded and we do only the research for them and to understand. But the good news for as a researcher is that Canadian cultivars or lines do carry resistance to Verticillium longisporum. Now, <clears throat> looking at another angle, we were interested to look at whether the stages of the plant would have different disease severities. That's an important part because in uh, to determine the epidemiology and to uh, sustain with uh, mitigation of this disease, either with a, a fungicide at a later stage, because we don't have fungicides at the moment, but they will be developed uh, if the pathogen becomes an uh, important pathogen across Canada. So uh, we have to have this uh, scientific knowledge about it. So you can see we had uh, different stages. I will go to the stages. So this is uh, the development stage uh, that we inoculated the plants. So one week after the plants were uh, growing, we inoculated the pathogen. This is two weeks after, and this is four weeks after seeding. And then you look at the disease severity, and you see that the disease severity was strongest, or highest, I should say, in the four week uh, 
after seeding, which means that the pathogen has established uh, in a different way after uh, the pathogen uh, in inoculum was taking uh, that into um, causing the disease. So if you look at the check varieties, uh, uh, sorry, the check uh, treatment, I should say, uh, week one, week two, and uh, week four, you see that the height of the plant is better and uh, the plants are stunted week one, week two, and the most stunted is the ones that were inoculated after week four, uh, after seeding. So that means there are some relationship physiologically that again we should understand better and that would be our concentration for the future, uh, future CAP project. Now, concluding here, the disease severity is higher in canola plants with inoculation at two week old and one month old uh, growth stage, that's four, four weeks, compared to a one week old growth stage. These results indicated that the verticillium longisporum causes higher damage at the later development stage of canola. Now, the next two areas I will uh, try to go uh, and explain. One was an isolation study that was uh, started last year to look at the presence of the pathogen in different provinces. That is because the uh, Saskatchewan and Ontario were uh, 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 having this particular disease, uh, verticillium longisporum, in fields, and the provincial plant pathologists were reporting this, and we took the samples and did our uh, studies on to understand whether it was verticillium longisporum or dalii or something else, and also to look at the lineage. So again, here's where I was trying to tell you earlier, the conidial size of verticillium dalii is smaller compared to the verticillium longisporum. Almost uh, uh, the longisporum uh, uh, spores are double the size of the verticillium dahlia. Now, when we did the Saskatchewan samples, this was an interesting uh, sample set. Although we didn't have a lot of samples, we had only six, and these six turned out to be very interesting, and what you find is that we have all three lineages, A1, D1, A1, D2, and A1, D3, because we had the primers uh, for the, uh, to characterize them separately, and also we had uh, uh, test uh, lines uh, to uh, isolates to make that determination. So um, we found all three in Saskatchewan. Now in Manitoba, it's much more clear that the predominant isolate is A1, D1. And in Ontario, you find that it is not the verticillium longisporum, uh, A1, D1, A1, D2, or A1, D3. It is the verticillium dalii that is present. Here's the marker for verticillium dalii, and uh, all the uh, Ontario isolates, even though we didn't have a lot, uh, turned out to be uh, verticillium dahlia. So these are very important uh, things to understand from an epidemiological standpoint when it comes to mitigation and all that, but also uh, understanding the evolutionary pattern and to understand how the pathogen is moving in uh, Canada. Now, Europe has done a lot of good work and we can take certain uh, cues from their studies to understand that evolutionary pattern in Canada. So in summary of the PCR, multiplex PCR work that we, I just presented, um, the primers uh, uh, here showed that all the isolates belong to verticillium genus, that means verticillium longisporum or verticillium dahlia, and the multiplex PCR could identify and differentiate verticillium longisporum from verticillium dahlia and determine verticillium longisporum lineages. Out of the six isolates uh, samples that we had, we uh, from Saskatchewan, they had three different lineages, which is interesting, and uh, three were identified as verticillium dahlia. Out of 14 isolates uh, from Manitoba, all were identified as A1D1. And finally, uh, three Ontario isolates uh, were uh, uh, characterized as verticillium dahlia. So this is very interesting. Three different provinces, three different results. So we are quite excited uh, as a scientist to uh, move forward with understanding the evolutionary pattern of this. 
And finally, I would like to uh, touch base, but I'm not going to present the whole uh, part of our genome uh, research because it's not complete yet. I just wanted to un uh, let you know that we are doing uh, genome analysis of the verticillium longis forum. And here's the, uh, again, showing those lineages. That's where our target is to understand how different they are when we can characterize. So when you do the genome analysis, you have to look at the parental uh, and lineage uh, uh, combinations. So here's verticillium longis forums, relationships to verticillium alfalfa and verticillium dahlia. So you see the interactions and uh, we are slowly deducing all this, dissecting, and we have lots of information, lots of data, but I'm not presenting that because it's not complete yet. But I just wanted to give you a small or brief snapshot of our work. Uh, you can see it has gone through a lot of uh, good identification of genes. So the uh, bottom line is that uh, the predicted effectors showed high expression in v napus tissue. So that's uh, the effectors from the verticillium longisporum. And in addition, large amounts of collinearity exist in the genome of verticillium longisporum. So that's something that is important. I would be encouraged to look at it from the view of the isolates from um, Europe to see how different they are. It may be because verticillium longisporum originated from verticillium dahlii and verticillium alfalfa, while verticillium dahlii and verticillium alfalfa share, share high genome collinearity. So that might be a lead for us to further investigate this. So I started with the challenges, and now I want to give you the good news. So we now have new knowledge on host resistance in canola in Canada. Very good news. Uh, uh, somewhat bad news, uh, we have all three lineages, A1, D1, A1, D2, and A1, D3. What does it really uh, have, whether it has a real impact on a change in the uh, pathogen survival, all that will be looked into. We don't know yet. Again, part of our CAP project will be uh, investigating that. Some knowledge on the spatial distribution of the pathogen is known. We will further study that. Knowledge on the survivability of the pathogen in soils is now coming to be known. We will take it to a different level uh, in the CAP project with microbiome studies, with uh, how fungi and uh, bacteria in the soil, beneficials, do have an impact on the survivability of these microsclerosia. And some knowledge on the genome and genes are now uh, well understood in our work. We will uh, finish that and publish, so we are getting closer to that. And new knowledge on the stage of canola crop that is most susceptible. That is, again, going to, into the intrinsic uh, nature of the pathogens uh, uh, infection process and trying to understand what kind of enzymes and things are upregulated and downregulated. So work continues on all these projects, and we are really excited to be presenting this today and hope that you have had an opportunity to uh, learn from uh, what I have presented, but also see the value of funding that makes things move forward. And I would take this opportunity in thanking some of the people that I've already mentioned, Dr. Fei Liu, Dr. Arya Dolabedanian, Dr. Jong Wei Zhou, and my uh, technician, Paula Parks, who sets up uh, the field uh, research, and the summer students ha who have worked from 2018 up to 2021. And Justin Cornelson and Dr. Vikram Bish uh, from Manitoba Agriculture have been extremely helpful because they go to the field, they see these diseases, uh, uh, happening in uh, farmers' fields, they collect the samples and sends it over to us to do further analysis. That's a great opportunity to work in collaboration with uh, people who are out in the field. And uh, again, to the uh, staff of Kelburn Farm and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada Portage staff who have been ex extremely helpful for us to conduct this research even during COVID times. So you can imagine the protocols that were required for us to enter these locations, and yet 
these staff was so accommodating for us to carry out the research because they understand the need for research has to continue even during COVID and especially when it comes to field research. So that's what we have been able to do thanks to Kelburn Farm staff and Portage staff. And none of this will be possible without the uh, funding. Uh, the first is the Canadian Agriculture Partnership or the CAP projects that uh, helped in uh, uh, helping us to uh, get this off ground with uh, uh, really good funding. Uh, and the Canola uh, Council of Canada, Saskanola, Manitoba Canola Growers Association, and the Alberta Canola Producers Commission. And also, last but not least, the University of Manitoba campuses, uh, the labs that I work and my students and postdocs work at. So, as you can see, that picture is from 2019. Unfortunately, since 2019, even as a lab, we have not been able to come together to take a single picture. So that's uh, really sad, but uh, at least we have a picture from 2019. I think this was taken in September, October of 2019, and uh, you can see some of these uh, people that have contributed to this work. The others are black -legged researchers, and that's my technician, uh, Paula Parks. So uh, I just wanted to finish with uh, uh, my email address and my two sons who often go with me to scout in the fields and they enjoy the yellow flowers and running around while I do the work. So thank you very much and I will be happy to entertain any questions that you have. Hello, and today I'll be talking about the project that is funded through CAP and it is ongoing in my lab. The title of the project is Genetics and Genomics of Brassica Nepus Resistance and Verticillium Longiosporum uh, Virulence. The first part of my talk, we will provide an overview of the pathogen, and uh, the second part would be the result part and what we have done so far. Verticillium Longiosporum is specific to the Brassicaceae, and it infect uh, brassica crops. The pathogen was given the name in, uh, of Verticillium uh, longiosporum, and recognizing as uh, species in mid-90. First report in Canada in, was in from Manitoba in 2014, and at the time, uh, the pathogen was labeled as quarantine pest. However, a later survey showed that the pathogen is uh, widespread across Canada and in different provinces. Frequently observed uh, disease symptoms are uh, chlorosis, senescence, and dark stripe on the stem and shredding of the stem. At the end of the season, black microsclerosia forms under the epidermis. Disease cycle start with uh, germination of spores in the soil, and uh, then the hyphae grows into the root, and from there into the xylem, uh, and upper part of the plant. When uh, patching grows into the xylem and produces spores, it clogs the mm, xylem, as is seen in the, this microscopy image, and then it disrupts the uptake of nutrient and uh, water from the soil. At the end of the season, microsclerosia that are uh, black spores that are shown here are forming on the stems. This uh, fell back into the soil to the stem decomposition and then pathogen is ready for another cycle of infection uh, in the presence of the host. The typical disease symptoms are chlorosis, black vein, and in very uh, exceptional uh, occasion, and severe infection, we get wilting in the greenhouse. However, the most notable uh, symptoms that under the field that can differentiate this disease is formation of black stripe and also uh, formation of uh, microsclerosia seen as black dots on the stem. Risk of verticillium disease to canola production is estimated anything between 10 to 50%. However, there is no accurate estimate 
for the yield loss and uh, this is something that we need to determine in Canada under the farming practice in Canada. Other uh, issues that could be associated with the disease are reduction in, far in farmland value because of when the pathogen establishes itself in the, in the soil, it's very hard to eradicate it. And restriction of canola export due to possible seed contamination. In terms of management, uh, there is no uh, fungicide effective against the pathogen, and in general, applying fungicide against uh, root pathogen is very difficult. Soil amendment is not practical, especially under the larger scale farming practice in Canada. The most viable option is genetically resistant cultivar. Uh, that is, this is the approach that we are taking and we are hoping that could, we could achieve this to, during this uh, research project. The two main objectives of the projects are genetics of brassica napus resistance to verticillium. Uh, this part, we, uh, the intention is to identify uh, resistance varieties, map the position of genes, and develop markers to be able to incorporate those genes into commercial uh, canola cultivars. Another part of the project is pathogen genomics, and the purpose of this part is to understand the biology of the pathogen, its virulence, how it does infect the plants, and also uh, through the genome sequencing and comparing it with other species of verticillium, we, are, we could develop species-specific markers. And if we have enough data from various isolate, uh, it is also possible to have uh, isolate-specific markers. For the genome sequencing, we started with using the Illumina uh, short read platform. We sequenced the genome of Verticillium Manitoba isolate, producing 40 million uh, pair end uh, reads. We trimmed those uh, reads and we applied soap de novo assembly uh, pipeline to um, assemble the genome. This draft assembly was used by Dovetail uh, to improve the assembly using high rise uh, assembly. The end result was is the genome with over 19,000 scaffold, and 24 of those scaffold were uh, larger than 1.2 megabases. This was, although we had some larger scaffold, but uh, the genome was uh, in too many scaffolds, and it was not, uh, we, we wanted to have a more improved genome. So at that time, I realized that uh, Bart Toma and in his lab, uh, Jasper de Potter are doing uh, genome sequencing. So I reached out to Bart and Jasper, and they kindly agreed to uh, run their pipeline on our uh, sequences. So Jasper took our uh, Illumina sequence and used a A5 pipeline to assemble the genome. This is a pipeline that is used for short read uh, assembly. He then used gap closer to uh, uh, bring the scaffold together, and at the end result was uh, 2,429 scaffold, uh, uh, with largest scaffold being 3.2 megabases. This slide shows the distribution of various scaffold um, and based on their length. We have, as, mention, as I mentioned, uh, scaffold with 3.2 uh, megabase length, and then uh, at the end of the spectrum, there are uh, very sh uh, smaller scaffold as well. Although this is uh, much improved compared to assembly that we did through uh, dovetail, uh, but still, uh, it's not a, a really a high uh, quality genome. However, what is important is that the size of the genome is similar to what has been published, and based on uh, Jasper's uh, comparison with, with the data that they had, is the genome representation and completeness is there. So we have genome represented here, although it's in is more fragments. 
Uh, I'm really delighted to see that Jasper has produced high quality genome uh, using long read and they, they have been recently published. Uh, so there are, uh, we intend to improve our genome based on using either the genome that uh, Jasper has published as uh, a reference genome. So we would use our uh, Illumina read and do a reference based assembly. In the event that we have a very mm, structural uh, variation between the two genomes, such as inversion uh, and uh, translocation that prevent us pro from assembly, we will uh, do a de novo assembly. And we have the pipeline for uh, doing a de novo assembly using uh, large, uh, long reads. We have ONT. Um, sequence is established in the lab and we have applied it uh, using uh, fly software to uh, assemble the genome of uh, club root. We have improved the club root genome from 109 uh, scaffold to uh, 19 contig. We have improved the genome of uh, leptospheria that we had from 500 uh, scaffold to uh, 36 scaffolds. So we have the pipeline, and if we, we need to de do a de novo assembly, uh, we can uh, do a de novo assembly on the Manitoba isolate. In the second part of the result, I would like to talk about our, uh, what we have done so far with uh, identifying the resistance uh, genes to uh, verticillium langosporum. First, I would like to give an overview of the inoculation method. This is a method that is established, uh, and it is was reported in a publication by Christina Oink when she was a PhD in uh, Andreas Stiedemann lab in Germany. We grow our plant in a mixture of uh, vermiculite and sand. We let them to grow for two weeks. Then we uh, take the plants, we wash uh, uh, the root, and we dip the root in a spore suspension of 10 to the 6 spore per ml. We leave it for 30 minutes to ensure that the infection ha happened. We then put this into the soil, and uh, when plants are transplanted into the soil, then we uh, move them to the greenhouse, uh, wash the uh, disease symptoms over the time, and as plants mature, and we record the disease, disease symptoms. At the start of the project, we didn't have uh, pathology tests established in the lab. Uh, we wanted to screen uh, brass relaxation for their response to verticillium. Uh, we started with NAM population uh, that Isabel uh, Parkin has developed in her lab in AFC. The NAM found a line. Uh, we gave them to Andrea Stedeman to conduct a pathology test for us. This is the data we got back from Andrea's lab. We have extremely susceptible line, we have a uh, very highly resistant line, and intermediate phenotype. So to uh, we choose the most resistant, NAM14, and the most susceptible line, NAM53, to uh, develop a population. To make sure NAM14 and NAM53 uh, shows the same response against the verticillium isolate from Manitoba. We infected them with, uh, with the Manitoba isolate. And as you see here, verticillium uh, uh, infected plants for NAM14 are highly resistant. They uh, happily grow, and there is no uh, stress symptoms. While NAM53 is dead, and is uh, quite a stark difference between these two lines in response to the uh, verticillium infection. After confirming the phenotype, we cross NAM14 with NAM53. We develop a fun population, and from there we developed a, um, a double haploid population, which is about 500 lines that we have so far. Here is the again the showing the response of NAM lines. Here we have uh, resistant lines, uh, not uh, infected, so they are non-inoculated non resistant lines as just control. Inoculated resistant lines, as, as you see, there is no stress. They are comparable in terms of growth to the non-inoculated plant. We have susceptible lines, non-inoculated. 
again they are uh, go growing normally and the susceptible line that has been inoculated showing the range of phenotype from death to severe stunting and to uh, severely being stressed and showing the chlorosis that I mentioned uh, earlier as one of the phenotype. With this, we were confident that we have the pathology test established, so uh, we started the larger scale uh, pathology test. At the same time, we asked Ralph Lang in Inotech Alberta to, uh, if he could help us with uh, running the pathology assay under their condition. Uh, the disease rating in both labs is uh, we are using the 1 to 9 scale as uh, reported, and 1 is resistant, 9 is uh, our dead plants. And we infected plants are in growing the greenhouse. Uh, we take uh, note from the disease progress over the growth stage, and we use the AUDPC formula to uh, rate the, uh, the disease uh, at the end of the disease uh, rating. Here is a snapshot of the. Mm, NAM population when infected with verticillium, we have a susceptible, intermediate, and resistant lines. So we have applied this uh, pathology test twice so far, once in our lab and once in uh, Ralph lab. Uh, we have the pathology data now. We have also uh, conducted uh, a SNP genotyping using the 60K array that is developed by AFC as well parking. So we have the genotyping data as well, and the mapping is in progress right now. Unfortunately, the mapping data was not ready by the time of this presentation, uh, but I'm hoping that the uh, uh, mapping data will be, will be ready in the coming months. The work uh, that we will be doing in the remaining uh, time for the project, as I mentioned, QTL mapping, that will be done shortly. Also, we are conducting RNA sequencing on resistant and susceptible lines. The purpose of this experiment is to uh, now to find out what are the uh, downstream defense uh, pathways again in the resistant lines. Are there any uh, novel genes that could be exploited for uh, improving resistance of canola to verticillium and we are hoping that this da data in combination with our uh, uh, genomics of the pathogen will produce uh, uh, interesting result into both management of the disease and also uh, understanding of the biology of the pathogen virulence. I would like to thank the people that in my lab that did the work. Mayarat uh, did most of the work that I presented here today. Uh, she has done a great job in establishing the uh, pathology uh, screening in our lab. We uh, didn't have uh, prior experience with this pathogen, and it's a very difficult pathogen uh, in terms of uh, disease evaluation. Param Haddadi uh, did the assembly of uh, the sequence of the verticillium using short lead Illumina sequences. Mehran is uh, helping uh, Maya in the greenhouse with pathology test and also with other greenhouse tasks. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the help from our collaborators, Ralph Lang, as I mentioned. We are working uh, together on this project and we are conducting pathology tests at the same time. Isabel Parking is helping us with the mapping part. Christina Oink is providing advi advice on uh, the disease and pathogen. Jasper uh, has been really great in helping us to improve uh, the genome assembly, and Andreas Tiedemann uh, did the first round of uh, screening of NAM population. Also in uh, Ralph Lang, Wendy Dimitrov has been really great in terms of communicating results with us, um, sharing her experience, and it has been great working with her. I would like to uh, acknowledge the funding that we got through CAP, and uh, provided by CAP partners, AFC, SAS Canola, Alberto Canola, Manitoba Canola Growers, and Canola Council of Canada. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Hello, everyone. My name is Isha Wang. 
I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Alberta. Today, I'm going to talk about the next challenge, verticillium stripe, evaluating disease, host resistance, and interactions with black lag. As you all know, there are some important field diseases of canola, like club root right here, sclerotinia stem rot, black leg, and also verticillium stripe. Because verticillium stripe is a relatively new disease, it was first found in Canada in 2014. So my research is primarily focused on verticillium stripe. Verticillium stripe caused by the fungus called verticillium longisporium. It is a monocyclic soil-borne disease. Microsclosia is the survival structure in the soil. And when you see canola in the field, root exudates stimulate microsclosia to germinate. The hyphae can grow inside of the root tissue and grow towards the xylem. The fungus can inhibit nutrient and water transmission, cause the xylem turn black and collapse. The microsclosia form on the stem and the stem start to shred to release microsclosia. As for the host range, it mainly attacked Brassicaceae family. Vericillium was first found in Manitoba in 2014, but based on CFIA's national survey in 2015, it has been present in other provinces. Based on 2020 canola disease survey, the prevalence of verticillium stripe in Alberta was 1.1%, and more than 30% of the field in Manitoba and some field in Saskatchewan have found verticillium stripe as well. Based on the research has been done in North Central Europe, new losses can range from 10 to 50%. As for symptoms, you could observe leaf chlorosis, the first two photos I took at my own field research plot last year, and the last two photos I took at my own greenhouse. And uh, if you grow the canola in the greenhouse, you could observe yellow leaf chlorosis at very early stage, like two to three uh, leaf stage. But if you grow them in the field, you hardly can see them at that early stage, but you could also observe during the uh, vegetative stage. And at the late stage, like flowering stage or seed formation stage, you could observe them both, both in the greenhouse and in the field, like the half green leaf and the half yellow leaf. This is also leaf chlorosis symptoms of verticillium stripe. Other symptoms, including stunting of the plant, as you can see in the photo in the middle, this plant is way more smaller than the other healthy plants. And when I grow canola in the greenhouse, I saw the stunting of the plant at very early stage, like uh, 28 days after inoculation. And the symptoms also include half stem senesis, like the unilateral striking. You can see in the photo, half of the stem is turning into yellow and the other half is still keeps green. And also the leaves are pretty much dead. Sometimes you can also observe on the pods, like the yellow half of the pods, but the other half is still green. At plant maturity stage, you could also observe black microscopia appear on the stem. Like I show the photo right here, half of the stem is turning into grayish color and the other half keeps green. Uh, those grayish color actually are the black microscopia colonized on the half of the stem. And they could also colonize the entire plant like right here. Uh, the entire stem turning into black or the grayish color. These are all black microsclosia. And this photo I took at my own field research plot last year, I saw those kind of stem tissue shredded at uh, like three months after I seeded my plot, uh, which is the typical symptoms of verticillium stripe. And after swathing, I also can observe uh, shredded parts of the stem as well. I want to talk a little bit about my field disease rating skill. I'm using zero to four rating skill. My focus is mainly on the coverage or the colonization by microsclosia. As you can see right here, disease rating at zero is of course healthy plants with no microsclosia visible on the stem. And disease rating at one is the slight colonization by microsclosia, which is that less than 25%. You could observe a little bit of the microsclosia on the base stem. Right here is kind of a grayish or black color. 
And the for disease rating at two is the moderate colonization by micro sclerosia, which is 75% less. As you can see here, pretty much those parts of the stem are turning into black. But compared to the entire stem, which is longer than that, it is less than 75%. So it is a rating of two. And for the rating of three, it's the extensive colonization by microsclosia. You can see here, uh, the whole plant is only this tall, but the microsclosia covered pretty much up here. These are all the black microsclosia covered on the entire plant, so it's more than 75%. And for disease rating at four, is the severe colonization by microsclosia. And you can see also peeling of the stem epidermis. Like you can see right here, uh, the pretty much the stem shredded, and uh, this is the rating as four. Now I'd like to take some time to introduce about my verticillium stripe research to you guys. The first part is understanding verticillium stripe and black-like interactions. And the second part is screening brassica genotypes for resistance to verticillium longisporium. As for verticillium stripe and black leg interactions, I did two year field experiments at the year of 2020 and 2021. I used two canola cultivars, one is CS2000 and the other is 45H31. I have six treatment, one with black leg or uh, L. maculus inoculum only, and uh, one is high concentration of black leg inoculum and low concentration of verticillium stripe inoculum, and one with mid level of black leg inoculum and mid level of uh, verticillium inoculum. And the other one is low black leg inoculum and high verticillium inoculum, and one with verticillium longisporum inoculum only as well as no inoculum control. And at plant maturity stage, I did disease assessment uh, for 10 plants for each, for black leg disease rating and also verticillium stripe disease rating. And I also collect plant heights and the yield also collected for each plot for data analysis. For disease assessment, as for black leg, I used zero to five rating scale. Uh, where disease at zero is the completely healthy plants with no uh, disease or discoloration of the cross-section area of the stem base. And for disease at one is less than 25% of decay on the cross-section area. For disease at two is 25 to 50% of the cross-section area decay. And for disease at three is 51 to 75% of the cross-section area decay. And for disease at four is more than 75% of the decay on the cross-section area. And for disease at five is the total death of the plant. As for verticillium strife disease assessment, I have just introduced you before, it's the zero to four rating scale. Let's see the results. For black leg disease severity, for both CS2000 and 45H31 canola cultivars in the year of 2020, had a relatively higher disease severity compared to the year of 2021. It was because in the year of 2020, it was a really heavy rainfall summer. So black leg is in favor of this kind of weather condition. That's why the disease shown severe compared to the year of 2021. As you all know, last year was a really dry and hot summer. As for control and verticillium stripe only plot, you could also observe uh, black leg disease severity show in these two uh, plots. That's because black leg spores can travel with rainfall and uh, wind. So these two plots got infected with black leg. However, for both cultivars, they all had relatively low black leg disease severity, which is around one disease rating. Uh, that's because these two cultivars were resistant to black leg disease. But verticillium stripe disease severely showed a different stories for both cultivars. For CS2000 and also 45H31, 
they all had a relatively higher disease severity in the year of 2021 compared to the year of 2020. That was because Bernicean strife is in favor of dry and hot condition. So especially for site two, they all had a higher disease severity is about 1.5 ish. Uh, for both cultivars, because they are not known resistant to verticillium stripe, so the disease show relatively high disease severities for both cultivars. I know seed yield is really important to growers. Unfortunately, in the year of 2020, some of my plot got flooded. So for both CS2000 and 45H31, Canola cultivars, I had a really low seed yield compared to the year of 2021. I know you all think probably control plot compared to other concentrations of black leg or vericinum plot seems they don't really have too much big difference of the yield. That's why I did a seed percentage yield loss to show how much they could infect of the vericinum stripe and also black leg seed yield. Here comes the percentage yield reduction result for CS2000. In the year of 2021, the verticillium stripe only inoculum plot had uh, about 20% of the seed yield reduction and with low black light concentration and high verticillium inoculum concentration, the percentage yield reduction is about 20% as well. But when the black light inoculum concentration gets higher, the percentage yield reduction is actually lower for CS2000. And for 45H31, it's kind of similar. For verticillium stripe only inoculum, uh, for both years, the percentage reduction is in between 10 to 20%. And with low black leg inoculum and high verticillium stripe inoculum concentration, the percentage yield is around 10%. And with increase of black leg inoculum for each plot, the percentage U reduction gets lower, which means black leg do not affect too much of the seed yield. But right now, verticillium stripe has a relatively higher seed yield percentage reduction compared to black leg disease. You may know black leg and verticillium stripe, they have similar cross section area discoloration. So I took a photo of two stems and I cut the cross-section area and they infected with different diseases. So can you tell which one is which disease? The answer is this one is black leg disease, cross-section area discoloration, and this one is verticillium stripe. And for this stem, it infected with two types of diseases. And you also can see two spore types on the same stem. So I enlarged the photo. Can you recognize which is which spore? So the answer is those dark purple color are belong to black leg disease. These are the pygmidia spore of black leg and they are larger than those small dots. Those small dots are microsclerotia from vericinium stripe. So next time when you see these two types of spores, you could tell which one is which. I know you're still confused about verticillium stripe and black leg cross-section area discoloration. And if you see from the top, when you cut the cross-section area, pretty much all the black leg infected plants are the greenish stem, but the cross-section area is like half or some parts are turning into black compared to the total grayish color on the stem. And uh, you could see the stem is like brownish color. And when you see the cross section area carefully, you could see the black leg infected cross section area. It has a like triangle white shape or like a black part. This one is severely infected with black leg. So it has only a little bit of the white part, but this one is totally black. But for verticillium stripe is like grayish color, not black at all. And uh, it doesn't have a clear white area that show no disease infected. And when you have black leg and verticillium stripe infected together with the same plant, 
for severely infected, you could ob of course observe the shredded and the outer layer of the stem is turning into black. And when you cut the cross section area is like in between of total black and gray. So that's why you could say, oh, I have black leg and verticillium stripe together on the same plan. One more useful method to tell black leg from verticillium stripe is to do a horizontal cut. For black leg infected plant, when you do a horizontal cut, you could find all those glycan tissue only uh, exist at the outer layer and the inner part, like the inner tissue of the stem are still white. But when you cut the verticillium stripe infected plant stem, and you could find the inner of the plant are pretty much hollow and uh, the inner part is like the black or grayish color and pretty much all the outside layer are kind of white but when you have black leg and verticillium stripe infected together the plant when you cut it horizontally not only the inside tissues are hollow but also the outside tissues are turning into black color and for these three photos, you could easily identify which is black leg and which is verticillium stripe. According to my own experiments, I found a very interesting thing that if you have both black leg and verticillium stripe infected together on the same plant, and you can see right here, pycnidia spore from black leg and also black microsclosia from verticillium stripe on the same plant the whole root system can turn into total black, like I showed you two photos on the screen. And uh, I think this is also a way to tell that you have two diseases on the same plant besides of the horizontal cut. This concludes the interaction studies of black leg and verticillium stripe. Right now, there are no canola cultivars are known to resistant to Verticillium longisporin pathogen. So I want to talk a little bit about my second project that I'm working on right now. It's the screening for resistance to Verticillium longisporin pathogen. So I did a greenhouse screening. I used 40 Brassica genotypes with 10 to the seventh per milliliter spore suspension to do the inoculation. And after inoculation, I did four disease assessment at 7, 14, 21, and 28 days post inoculation. And I used the area under disease progress curve as AUDPC to do data analysis. In order to find which genotype is resistant and which genotype is susceptible, I need to normalize AUDPC. So I need to have a multirently resistant check and a susceptible check. So I used number six as the moderately resistant check and number 11 as the susceptible check. So this is the normalized AUDPC result. Uh, there are some promising genotypes that show probably moderately resistant to verticillium longisporin pathogen, like number five, number seven, number 18, number 27, and number 40 brassica genotype. Um, because this is only a preliminary study, so I will do more research on it. Uh, but as you can see, we have some promising genotypes that may have resistant to verticillium longisporin. Besides of greenhouse screening, I also did field assessment. I chose nine canola cultivars that are popular in the market, also available in our lab. These are 45CM39, 45CS40, B3010, BY6076, BY6204, CS2600, L234, L255, and L345. So I put 70 milliliter of green inoculum per row to seed with the seeds, and I did the emergence count as well as disease assessment at plant maturity. And also I collected seed yield for data analysis. These two photos were taken about six weeks after seeding. On the left hand side is the control plots with no inoculum added. And on the right hand side is verticillium 
stripe inoculated plot. As you can see clearly, like the inoculated plots has fewer plants compared to the control plots, which means the emergence has been severely infected by the inoculum. Here's the emergence count data. The green bar is the control plot and the yellow bar is the inoculated plot. You can see it clearly that for the number of plants per row, the inoculated plot had fewer plants compared to the control plots for all cultivars. And some cultivars even reduced half when the inoculum were added into the plot. This is consistent of the photo that I showed you before, that emergence count has been severely infected by verticillium stripe inoculum added. I also did disease severity assessment at zero to four rating scale at plant maturity stage. For all canola cultivars, all control plots had no disease at all, so the disease severity were rated at zero. And for all inoculated plots, they had disease severity rating less than one. That was actually a surprise to me, because based on the emergence count data, I thought the infection was really bad, so the disease severity should be higher. But the actual disease severity that I conducted showed that the disease severity ratings were really low, which is less than one. I also collected seed yield for all cultivars. Green bars represent control plots and yellow bars represent inoculate plots. Most canola cultivars do not have big difference between control plots and the inoculate plots, except for two cultivars, 405CM39 and BY6076. This concludes the field screening results of my experiment. Finally, I have some take-home messages for you. Although black leg and verticillium stripe have similar cross-section discoloration, if you do a horizontal cut, that could help you to distinguish these two diseases. And based on my experiment, I found that verticillium stripe can cause higher yield losses than black leg. Although right now we have no verticillium stripe resistant canola cultivars available in the market, but based on my screening, I found some brassica genotypes are resistant to verticillium longisform pathogens. And when you use commercial canola cultivars, verticillium stripe can affect plant emergence, but do not have a major impact on seed yield. Lastly, I want to thank my co-supervisors, Dr. Xiaofan Huang and Steven Strokoff, the staff at the University of Alberta Applied Plant Pathology Lab for their technical assistance. I also want to thank the financial support that I get from Canola Agronomic Research Program, along with the Canola AgriScience Cluster. Thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. Um... Thank you for the invitation um, so I can speak here um, during this part Loom workshop. Uh, so my name is Jasper de Potter and I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Cologne in the Terrestrial Microbiology Lab. Um, I study now uh, smut pathogens, but during my PhD I've um, studied for the Loom Longus Forum and that is what I'm uh, going to talk about today. So my PhD was a shared project between uh, England and the Netherlands. Um, so in Netherlands, I worked uh, at Wageningen University, and in um, England, I worked uh, at NIAB, which is the National Institute of Agriculture and Botany, uh, which is uh, situated in Cambridge. Uh, and the incentive, QAM, um, came from England to study Vertserum longisporum in all seed rape, uh, because since 2007 in the United Kingdom, they have seen a rise or an, an emergence um, of verticillium stem striping in all seed rape production systems. And that was basically the incentive to start the project and also study what the impact was of this pathogen on um, all seed rape production and also where it comes from. Um, so they typically saw these very specific uh, stem striping symptoms, which you see at the end of the growing season in all seed rape. Um, and here you can then nicely see that it's ba basically this microsclerosia, which are these clumps of melanized uh, cells that come at the outside um, of the OC rape stem. So here you see the complete uh, life cycle 
So I was talking about these microsclerotia, these um, melanized cells, and they are survival structures basically, and they can reside in the soil for quite a long time. And then when you have a host that grows in the proximity of these um, cells, um, then they can, uh, these cells can germinate and they can affect the host. And then they um, go inside through the roots to the host and they colonize the xylem. Then quite interestingly in all seed rape, and it also distinguishes itself from other vertulium species, is that uh, vertulium stays quite latently in the, in, in the plant. So during the growing season, you don't see any symptoms. But it's only at the end of the growing season during senescence um, that you see these striping symptoms, which are the microsclerotia that, that basically come out uh, of the stem. Um, that's also why we call it stem striping, and we don't call it vertulium wilt, because in generally, um, the other vertulium pathogens, they cause wilt on their host. Vertulium longisporum is also, in, from a genomic point of view, quite an interesting species in the vertulium genus, uh, because it's a hybrid. Um, the others are haploid uh, species. Um, Vertulium longisporum is actually a name for a collection of different hybridization events. So currently they have been three described, which is the A1D1, A1D2, and A1D3 hybridization events. And they are named like that based on the hybridization parents. So they're in the three instances, instances it has always been the A1 parent that hybridizes with a D parent. And um, if you look here at the phylogeny, the D parents are closely related to Vertulium dali, and the A1 parent is more distantly related to Vertulium dali. Um, apart from the fact that it is a hybrid, there is also um, some biological information related um, that can be correlated um, to these different genome constitution. So if we take Vertulium dali, Collectively, this species has a very broad host range, which includes like olive, tomato, um, and other uh, species. But it generally does not affect brassica species. And that is then, a, on, on the contrast, the specialized host for Verticillium longisporum. Verticillium longisporum uh, is often found in uh, brassica uh, species which then Vertisium dali generally does not infect. So then also made us hypothesize, like, is it possible um, that this hybridization enabled Verticillium to uh, colonize uh, Brassica hosts or Brassica plants? But like I said, the incentive came from the United Kingdom because there had been a recent emergence of Vertisium longisporum in the field. And one of the things I wanted to check is I wanted to know where the isolates came from or how they relate to um, previously sampled um, Vertisium longisporum strains. So therefore I sampled um, some British strains myself, but also I received some um, isolates from uh, growers. And then I collected or tried to gather a collection basically with samples from Sweden, from Germany, also from uh, the USA, Latvia. So yeah, you could see it in the list where the samples came from basically. Um, most of the samples were A1D1 strains. Um, and interestingly, all the samples that I got uh, from the United Kingdom from all Serb, they all belong to the A1D1 uh, lineage. Um, so that seems to be the predominant one. Uh, in the United Kingdom, um, in the all state rape uh, production systems. So based on these samples, I did in a population study. So I only used the A1D1 samples, uh, actually. Um, and I did this based on SSR markers. Um, so SSRs are simple sequence repeats, which are specific loci in the genome. And they are very susceptible to um, length polymorphisms. And based on that feature, I uh, then did the population study and, and try to cluster the different samples based on uh, on the polymorphisms or the diversity. And then quite interesting, the, really the result was that we have um, two populations or two main populations. And one of them is here, so including the black dots, which uh, were the British samples. And then you have the other one, which is less diverse, 
um, which included the Swedish and uh, German isolates. So that was quite interesting. So that in a population where we observed um, this recent emergence of uh, verticillium stem striping, that actually the population um, that we had sampled, so the British population, now they were more diverse compared to uh, populations that we know have been established for a longer time um, in all seed rapes, so um, in Sweden and in Germany. And that made us also hypothesize and made us also think that it's likely or that it's uh, yeah, possible um, that this recent emergence of um, versidium stem striping in the United Kingdom is not due a single or limited amount of introductions of the pathogen in the United Kingdom, uh, but rather it is possible that this population is already present there for a longer time, uh, but might have been emerged for different reasons, for example, environmental regions uh, or different reasons like the use of different cultivars, which are more susceptible um, to a vertium longisporum and where also the uh, symptoms are more obvious because of the use of these more susceptible cultivars. But that's pure hypothetical, of course. So based on this um, relative occurrence of these populations in Europe, um, I call them so the West and the East uh, population. And that's also how I will refer to them in the uh, further slides of my presentation. Um, so then I wanted to study a bit more of the genome evolution and actually what the impact was of hybridization on the evolution of the Fertisium longisporum. And therefore we sequenced uh, three uh, strains. So we sequenced two strains from the A1-D1 um, hybridization, um, which is then uh, one from the West population and one from the East population. So VLB2 came from England and VL20 from Latvia. And then I also wanted to compare between different hybridization events and therefore we also sequenced A1-D3, um, which originates from Japan. We wanted to have high quality genomes um, and therefore we used next generation sequencing uh, long reads. Um, so the A1-D1 strains were sequenced with that bio and the A1-D3 with Oxford nanopore combination with Illumina to have better base calling. Um, and to then actually have these um, genome assemblies on chromosome level, we also use chromatin confirmation capture um, to have then yeah, very nice high quality genome assembly. So after that, we obtained genome assemblies that were more or less double the size than of Verticillium dali. So here you see the three strains that we uh, sequenced and assembled. And here is the Verticillium dali strain that had previously been sequenced and assembled um, in the laboratory of Wageningen. Um, and this you can consider as a reference for an haploid Verticillium species. So you see very nicely that the genome size, but also the chromosome number is more or less double, also the number of predicted gene is more or less double. So it really seems like that this after hybridization, that it's, it's, it's also been an, a genome duplication, basically. So just one detail. So here you see that I say there are 16 or 17 chromosomes. Why is that? Um, this is because we aren't sure if chromosome 13 occurs once or twice in the genome of uh, the A1-D3 strain. So generally the coverage was around 60, but that chromosome specifically was around 110. So it's possible that a large fraction of that chromosome is actually present uh, twice uh, in the genome. Um, so it's possible that it, yeah, that actually there is one additional um, chromosome. Okay, and then I did my comparative study, and therefore it's very important. This or the phylogenetic relationship is quite important to then understand uh, the rest of the presentation, and that's why I wanted to show it once more, um, because I said that during the hybridization there always has been this A1 and the D parent, and the A1 parent is more distantly related to Verticillium dali compared to the D parent, and this has been crucial in the segregation of, of these two subgenomes within our uh, Verticillium longisporum assemblies. So what we did of the assemblies, we looked at the sequence identity of these genome regions um, in our Verticillium longisporum assemblies and compared 
that to Wurzelin Dalie. And then we always had these bimodal uh, distributions. So one fraction of the genome was more uh, identical uh, or more similar to Wurzelin Dalie, and one is more distant. And if you then look at this phylogenetic relationship, the more similar one is the D parent, and the more distant one is the A1 parent. So based on that, we could segregate the two genomes. And then also very nicely, if we did that, then the sizes were very similar of a typical haploid um, verticillium species. Um, so it really seems like there is, there, there is really like half of the one parent's genetic material and half of the other parent's uh, genetics material. Um, after the segregation, then we also wanted to check this west and east population. So we sequenced a, let's call a reference strain um, of each of the population. Um, do they originate from the same hybridization events or are they actually two separate hybridization events but have the same hybridization parents? But then if we look at the uh, genetic distance between the different subgenomes of these two different strains and between um, the same parents, but between the different populations or the different strains, we see this is very symmetrical. So it's, we think it's very unlikely that they originate from a different hybridization event, but that they actually originated uh, from one uh, hybridization event. And that these two populations diverged based on um, geographical, um, because they were ge geographically um, like yeah, isolated from each other. So now, so after that, we identified which sections of the genome belong of uh, originate from the A1 parent and which ones from the D parent. Um, I visualized then which genome regions that were basically. And then you see it's quite striking and also quite interesting that uh, so most chromosomes actually comprise of regions um, that are from different parental origins. Um, and then we wanted to study further, yeah, what actually happened. This is in homogenization. So is it possible that yeah, because of homology that certain fractions of certain subgenomes um, occur multiple times? Or is it actually possible that you have these um, chromosomes for the two parents and they started to recombine with each other? So to then study that further, the gene evolution, I We'll use some terminology. So I will use the words paralog, homeolog, and ortholog, so which are written here. And first, I wanted to make it clear um, what the distinction is. So they are all homologs, um, but their evolutionary route is different. And that's for we use a different yeah, a, a nomenclature. So orthologs basically are uh, homologous genes which occur in different species. So here you have the ancestral gene and then you have a speciation event where they diverge from each other. So this brown and this yellow one now occur in different species. So they are called orthologs. And then you also have um, often gene duplication events. And after this gene duplication event, you have um, a, a, a particular gene and multiple copies. And these genes that occur in multiple copies within the same organism, we call paralogs. And then it's also possible that these um, that genes from different species or so orthologs that these species then hybrid hybridize with each other and then that these um, different copies so these orthologs become or then reside in the same hybrid organism and then we call it homeologs so homeologs are of specific importance uh, for the research that i did because I study an interspecific hybrid. So one thing uh, that I did then, I looked at these homologs. So I looked um, within the whole genome assembly, but also within the different subgenomes, uh, how many um, yeah, hom homologs are there actually, or how many uh, homologs are there? And then we see that if you consider the whole genome assembly, that's 85% um, for the um, A1, D1 um, lines and around 80% for the A1, D3 lines um, have genes in two copies. But then if you segregate that, so if you 
have the um, separate parental subgenomes, that completely vanishes. So this indicates that the presence of most genes in double copy originates from the hybridization. So these um, two copy genes are homologues from each other. And the fact that this is 5% more in the A1B1 uh, strain compared to the A1B3 strain might be an indication that uh, A1B3 um, hybridized earlier because a phenomenon that is often observed in uh, hybridization events that leads to genome duplication is that this, this um, allodiploid then re reverses to its original ploidy state. So you get actually an haploidization event. Um, which might be already in a further stage in the A1D3 uh, lineage compared to the A1D1 lines. So then the most likely hypothesis is that during the hybridization, you have these two chromosome sets from the different parents that then came into the same cell and then they started to recombine with each other. And evidence that is Actually, the case is if we aligned the genome assembly of PLB2 and PL20, because they belong to the same hybridization event, which we also saw because of this nice symmetry between the uh, subgenomes, and you see that there has been frequent recombination even after um, the, um, even despite them coming from the same hybridization events, that there has been a frequent recombination uh, throughout their um, yeah, evolution and their divergence, basically. This is also a phenomenon that we observe in haploid Hertzian species. So then another hypothesis of something that has been observed um, in allodiploidization or um, genome doubling in general, is that because you have the presence of a lot of genes or most genes but an extra copy, that that might lead to gene relaxation. So the fact that for most genes you have an, an, an homologue that backs up its function may allow it that more changes may occur. Uh, so for example, more um, amino changes in the protein that has been encoded uh, by that particular gene. And that's something we try to test. So for every gene that has um, an homologue in a uh, one homologue in the A1, D, or Vertium Dali, Vertium alfalfa, non alfalfa nubilum, I made such a phylogenetic tree. Um, so alfalfa, non alfalfa, nubilum are also haploid Vertium species. So I made such a phylogenetic tree. Um, and then I calculated um, the omega, and the omega is the ratio or non-synonymous substitutions over synonymous uh, substitutions. So anonymous substitutions is also has been always uh, normalized over the amount of uh, non-synonymous sites there were, and the same for the synonymous substitutions. So we're also normalized um, for the amount of uh, synonymous sites. And then I only looked at these substitutions on the um, species uh, specific line basically and then based on this ratio i um, determined fast evolving genes and slowly evolving genes so far uh, fast evolving genes have this ratio of non-synonymous substitution of synonymous substitution which is higher than for the one for virtual alfalfa non-alfalfa and the bilum and then you have slow genes which means is a slower for these, uh, then these three haploid species. And I did this for the A1 species and the two hybridization events and for the three different strains and for the D parents and for Verticillium dali. And based on that, we could draw some conclusions. So if you look at the A1 um, species, we see that there are generally more fast evolving genes and slowly evolving genes. Um, and we see that this is more present in the uh, PD589, so the A1D3 lineages. So if there is a general more gene relaxation, it has been it is present in a higher extent in this lineages compared to these two other lineages, which originate from the same hybridization event, so the A1D1. But then most interestingly, we also want to see a difference between the haploid um, species and um, the hybrids or the 
and or the D1 parents, which currently exists in a hybrid constitution, so have this backup uh, of gene function. And then we also saw that for Cylindalia has the lowest amount of fast evolving and the highest amount of slowly evolving genes, which was, um, yeah, which then for the hybrid ones, you see that you have more fast evolving genes. And also here again, we see that the uh, A1D3 lineage, so the A1D3 uh, strain um, has more fast evolving genes and less slowly evolving genes compared to the two strains from the A1D1 lineages. So in general, we can see that um, there are indications that there is more relaxed um, uh, gene evolution. So basically there are more non-synonymous uh, substitutions um, in the um, hybrid um, in Vertium longisporum compared to Vertium dalian. And if you then compare within Vertium longisporum, you see that this mm, hasn't been to a further extent in uh, the PD5A9, so the A1B3 lineages. So this also might be an indication that uh, A1D3 lineage is hybridized before the A1D1 uh, lineage. Then we also studied the transcriptome uh, changes and um, we wanted to compare initially, we wanted to compare the expression of the subgenome with the original parents. But as I said before, um, this could not have been done because the haploid parent um, of the A1 has never been found and I, actually the D1 is also considered a different species and this haploid species has also never been found in nature. Um, and also more generally, there is not really a sister species which is closely related to A1, which we could use and specifically to compare A1. So in the end, we decided to um, compare the expression all with Vertisulium dalie and then see if, a, if one homologue was higher regulated when we do here this up or one is uh, down regulated, we do it like this. Um, and this is a bit of an overview picture. So the take home message is actually that most of the genes are not differentially expressed for Vertisulium dalie. And, and other trends that you could see that in general, the A1 parent had more differentially expressed genes than compared to the D parent which corresponds to the phylogenetic relationship of Vertisulium dalia being more closely related to the D parent than, um, than, A1, than the A1 parent. And also, if you look at the number of differentially expressed genes, is that the um, A1B3, so or you can also see, uh, see it here in general, that generally they have high, um, this lineage is, as a higher number or of differential expression compared to the A1D1 strains. So which might also be an indication that it hybridized earlier so that may more specific expression patterns have evolved. But then we also looked at the overall picture and looked at the correlation of expression pattern. And there we saw something quite nice. So if we have here, JR2 and CQ2, which are two Vertisulium dalia species. Uh, here we have VLB2 and the two subgenomes and VL20, which belong to the same hybridization event. And then here you have um, PD583, which is the A1D3 hybridization event. I see this um, red cube uh, in the middle. Um, so basically you see that the subgenomes within the same hybridization event have a very similar expression pattern. Um, and for example, if you have the A1 species, um, this one is um, more similar than the D1. So within the same hybridization event, then uh, compared to the same um, species in a different hybridization event. So for example, the PD5A3, the A1 is um, much lighter um, red. So in general, you can say that upon hybridization, this expression pattern of these uh, subgenomes homogenized to a specific extent. And these two subgenomes, so these homologues have a more similar expression um, after hybridization. Nonetheless, we looked also at genes which have a differential homologue expression. And um, we specifically looked at secretome genes, because secretome genes are um, very interesting for plant pathologists because uh, they're quite important 
um, for the colonization of the pathogen in the host because it modulates immunity um, and also uh, modulates metabolism uh, and facilitate actually the colonization. And we see there that secretome genes have um, generally more homo differential homeolog expression compared to uh, other genes, both if um, presumably sperm grows in planta or in vitro. Um, and then uh, we look then more specifically of um, these genes that have a different homeolog expression when they grow in planta. And then we looked, compared them to the expression in vitro. And then we saw that um, there are um, homeolog specific responses upon um, the colonization of uh, plants uh, versus um, in growth and culture medium. So homeolog, homeolog different responses, what do I mean with it? For example, if the A1 um, homeolog is higher expressed than the D1. If then Bertium longisporum grows in the culture medium, that means that this uh, differential expression is not observed or the inverse expression is observed. Uh, and we see this for the majority of genes, which is quite an interesting finding. So to summarize um, the findings of Bertium longisporum, so we saw a mosaic genome structure which originates for recombination. So upon hybridization, these um, different sets of chromosomes of different parents start to recombine with each other. And it's still, re uh, chromosomal recombination is still a big part of the evolution um, of vertisum longisporum, but also other vertisilium strains. Uh, we saw a global acceleration of gene evolution, which is um, likely due because of the fact that most genes are present and um, with an extra copy. So we have this functional backup. We saw gene expression homogenization upon hybridization. So we see that the expression pattern of the two um, differential subgenomes with different parental, or, um, different parental origins have very, very similar um, expression uh, pattern within the same hybridization event. And then we also see that if we do see differential expression between homologs, that they often uh, occur in, um, in the secretomes of genes that produce uh, proteins that are secreted. And throughout the presentation, I frequently hinted that the A1D3 lineages has signs that it hybridized earlier than the A1D1 uh, lin uh, lineage. So I want to thank many people. So many people have changed uh, institutes as well. So mainly I have this research, I've performed this research in the Netherlands at Wageningen and at NIAP in the United Kingdom. Um, and these were all the people involved. And, uh, massive thanks to them. So thank you for your attention. Um, yeah, this was my uh, presentation. Great. Thank you, everyone, for all of your presentations. Uh, in addition to the, the research uh, summaries that you guys saw today, uh, in the works is a verticillium stripe video featuring some of the research uh, that you just saw along with the details about the disease's life cycle. Funding for the video was provided by Alberta Canola, SAS Canola, the Canola Council of Canada with additional funds from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. So we've got a short video for all of you today with the full video rolling out early this spring. Verticillium stripe was first discovered in Manitoba in 2014. Since then, we've found it all across Canada. Uh, there's a few key diagnostic features that um, growers and agronomists should be looking for when scouting their canola fields. This particular pathogen is considered to be a soil-borne pathogen, and also it produces this very minute sclerotia that we call microsclerotia. And these microsclerotia can live in the soil for a long time. From the project that we have in lab, I think there are two uh, main uh, findings that will help farmers in the future. We are hoping that the, uh, the source of the resistance we have identified, we will be able to provide those sources with uh, molecular markers to breeders so they could incorporate it in, in the commercial varieties. All right, uh, we're now in the Q&A portion of our meeting. So again, questions can be asked uh, by typing in the Q&A box and they'll be addressed as they come forward. If you have um, a specific presenter that you wish to hear from, please address them in your question. 
So we'll get started. Um, I guess now I can ask all of the presenters to please turn on their cameras. Um, so the first question here is, are there other canola diseases where symptoms show on only half the stem? And I'm not sure who wants to take a stab at that one. Maybe I will. Uh, yeah, the verticillium um, stripe disease has that half side of uh, infection that you see. And uh, a similar symptom can be seen with fusarium wilt also on canola. That was um, uh, the issue in the early 2000 period, uh, but very quickly we realized that most of the varieties that are grown in Canada uh, have the resistance to uh, fusarium wilt. So that was good news at the time. Excellent. Um, Next question here, are differences in susceptibility among hybrids um, or regarding the differences in susceptibility among hybrids, is this also seen between harvest management systems, um, straight cut versus uh, swathed? The, I, I guess I can address that um, quickly, but I'll turn it over to the researchers after I ramble on. Um, but with, um, with our growing season, allowing that pathogen to move into the plant, so the, the longer that those plants are out in the field, um, the more likely they're going to have more damage because of this pathogen. So when we look to um, straight commenting, right, those fields are left or those plants are left for several weeks. Um, and so it's just allowing that pathogen to cause more damage. So there is that potential and, and use Manitoba as an example. We have a lot of acres that are straight cut and that might be one of the reasons why we see a lot of verticillium across the province. All right. Uh, next question. How much of a contributor to the spread of the pathogen has blowing soil movement been over the last number of years? Maybe because we did uh, start uh, looking at the dispersal patterns. So in uh, most of the diseases that you would uh, see from pathogens that are airborne, you will see a fairly uh, a close gradient, a gradient from the starting point or the focal inoculum point. So for example, blacklid, sclerotinia, you will have that gradient, uh, fusarium head blight in wheat, a nice gradient. In soil-borne pathogens that are uh, being dis more dispersed due to soil and air movement, the soil particle movement, you will not see that. And that's exactly what we saw in our studies at the Kelburn farm, uh, where you couldn't find a nice gradient. So the, the, the pattern was all mixed. And certain places you had more inoculum. And that is mainly because at a particular day, at a particular time, the inoculum would have moved because of high winds or something in that direction. So that would plant itself in that place and there wouldn't be a gradient forming. Okay. Um, how would you distinguish verticillium stripe and fusarium wilt in the field? So uh, a, a tough one, uh, especially earlier on, um, if you're looking um, you know, kind of prior to harvest, uh, the symptoms will be very similar with that half stem senescence. Um, the best way is to wait. If you're trying to identify in the field is to wait. Um, and then eventually you'll be able to see uh, the microsclerotia forming for plants that are infected with verticillium. Um, if you're trying to get an answer sooner, the best thing is to send them to a diagnostics lab to get confirmation of the pathogen. But I think uh, just to add to what uh, Justine said, I think it's uh, exactly uh, what it is, what you said, Justine. And I, I mean, now that uh, people uh, would know the difference between seeing micros microsclerosia and not, I do not think it's a requirement that they send it to uh, a diagnostic lab because it's 
pretty evident that you can see the microsclerotia and it's very clear that that's then the verticillium wilt uh, stripe and uh, not the uh, uh, fusarium wilt. Um, there's a question here for Dr. Fernando. Um, someone's wondering if they can send you a few samples from North Dakota for identification. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. I would be happy to uh, have, yes, thank you. Um, another question here. Uh, would it be fair to say that about half the material in Delantha's coded study appears to resist infection from verticillium stripe? Yeah, so that's really the good news. Uh, the only thing that I don't know and what Becky did is different is Becky knew the varieties that she was studying. In the work that we do, uh, they're all coded by the companies. So we don't know whether they are varieties like what Becky uh, looked at or whether they are uh, elite lines or uh, genotypes of parental lines that they are crossing for their material from the seed companies. I would love to know that, but uh, that's a part of uh, the intellectual property of the seed companies. Um, what is the most susceptible stage in the field? Is verticillium longisporum similar to Dahlia? and occur later in the season? Justine, would you like to take that question or, or Becky? Because <laughs> Becky did some work in the field as well. Yeah, I was, um, it, it does come in later in the season. As for, for Dahlia, same thing, very late uh, coming in and where we notice symptoms. It's something we don't notice, you know, seedling stage, flowering stage, it's usually very later on. Um, and actually just to address one of the questions that had come in through the chat about, you know, when is the most ideal time to look for verticillium? You know, is it prior to harvest? Is it post harvest? It really depends on what that end goal is. And with any of our canola disease serving, happens, we say around 60% seed color change. Um, having a straight cut canola, that's really sort of changing our goal, right? We wanted to, we want to be able to assess the levels of damage, the severity of the disease. So, um, you know, the closer to harvest, if it is being straight cut, the better, because then you're knowing and identifying the levels of actual pressure and potential yield loss. Um, if we're just looking to ID it in a field, post it is easier to do that um, for, for verticillium, um, but it, it doesn't really grasp or capture, you know, what that potential yield loss is because the, the symptoms are going to be that much more severe. Maybe if I can add to that, uh, uh, Kaylee. Um, so it's very difficult to know exactly when the uh, pathogen might be uh, really causing the disease. However, when we looked at it at three different growth stages, by inoculating at those different growth stages, then you see a more stunted growth at the four week uh, 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 time period when we inoculated after the plant had started to grow. So is that an indication that uh, the plant is more susceptible at that time? And can you uh, correlate that to the field? I don't know the answer, but I think uh, that's a fair indication that that might be a, a time period that it might be most susceptible. So some of the physiological changes that the plant might be going through due to growth, some of the enzymes that are important in growth versus defense might be acting. And that's part of the things that I would be uh, happy to uh, look for in the next uh, cap funding uh, through a verticillium uh, uh, research. <laughs> Um, was there any characterization of the germplasm resistance or susceptibility based on the commonly used commercial traits, uh, Roundup Ready, Liberty, Linker, Clearfield? Any comments on that? So again, uh, Becky would have a better understanding because um, 
she did uh, knowing known varieties. We don't know the varieties, and we didn't particularly uh, ask the companies about that. We did put the uh, uh, germplasm or genotypes into in, uh, already established fields. So we don't we we never inoculate. We go with the established fields where there was natural inoculum. That's it. So we don't. So that. Partly might be a, a way to um, establish, and I, I would hope that this would lead into uh, just like the black leg screening that we have been doing in 12 different locations for almost 35 years or whatever, even before my time, um, would be a good thing to do. And I think at least we now know two um, places that we can do at least in Manitoba, and there will be other places in Alberta and Saskatchewan as we move along. Now, the disease is not prevalent in those provinces as Manitoba, so that might be a good start to first have all the germplasm coming to Manitoba and establish these as co-op sites, and then move on in the future if the pathogen comes to become an issue in Alberta and Saskatchewan. This was the same uh, um, way that uh, fusarium head blight screening was established first in common Manitoba, and then with the pathogen moving to uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta, there were other um, nurseries established after that. But uh, to get started, I think Manitoba would be a wonderful place to test these for the seed companies. <laughs> Um, how diverse um, is the population of Verticillium longisporum we have in Canada as compared to the European population? Jasper, would you like to answer that question or maybe Hossein? I mean, uh... Sorry, Jasper. I, I just I will start, and I think Jasper uh, has a better insight into the genome comparison. But uh, this is something that really we need to do in Canada. I think we don't have any um, just the genome sequence that we have put together, and the work that Jasper has done, and similar work that Delanta's work is going is a start point, a starting point. And I think we need to do a. a study for this in, in Canada and see how diverse are our isolate. I would, uh, yeah, hopefully they are not too diverse because uh, one indication, as uh, Delenta mentioned, there is, there is many varieties that they are resistant. So it, that could be an indication that we don't have a very diverse population in, in, in Canada. Although having said that, resistant to verticillium is quantitative. So again, if you're if your lines or majority of the lines are resistant, one, one interpretation, it could be that the pathogen is not very diverse. Another, another interpretation could be that uh, there are QTLs that are uh, fortunately distributed in different germplasm and uh, the multigen effect also uh, create that resistant to be prevalent. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's my take on it. So. One of the, uh, thank you, Hossein. I think that's correct. And one of the things that I would add is because we have been testing all these um, genotypes uh, in Manitoba um, in two different places, all that we have found is the A1D1 in Manitoba and not the A1D2 and A, A, A1D3 as we have found in Saskatchewan. Um, so I don't know the answer as to the virulence and pathogenicity uh, aspects of it, but um, that's again something that we would be uh, really uh, interested in studying further with the, uh, if uh, seed companies are interested in participating. One, one thing that I would like to add here, and I, sorry, uh, Kelly, I couldn't start my video for some reason because I think it doesn't, yeah, it says that it's locked. But the, uh, one thing that I'm alerted and worried about is that after Jasper's talk, and this is a question maybe to Jasper, is that given that the genome is so uh, highly dynamic, first of all, the question is that why really VL verticillium just from that has a more dynamic genome in terms of expression uh, and also 
So, and also in term of more relaxed in term of evolution, if I um, correct in term, so why it is not, it, it, is, it has a narrower host compared to Berthesium dahlia. The second question that I have, and it is, it is I think, alerting is that if verticillium is such a dynamic, has a such a dynamic genome in terms of expression and evolution relaxed, is there a, is there a danger of host jump? And do you have any evidence of that? Um, so it is indeed true that because of this hybridization that you have basically just more material to evolve. Um, and there are also some hypotheses like, they often see if there is a hybrid that there is a shift of host or a different specialization because once the hybrid happens basically so when you have your hybrid then it's the, um, the evolutionary history as a hybrid is non-existent basically and then it needs to look for a niche basically where it has the opportunity to marginally colonize and then gradually evolve and uh, adapt um, so that's often yeah why we then see that yeah it's marginally colonizes and then continues to to evolve by i don't know often they also you have to see the lesions or something so that um, parts of the genome are thrown are thrown out which are not uh, helpful and then often they also see that it evolves back uh, to the originally ploidy state so back to the haploid but with first human spore we see it's very much a diploid still so that would indicate that in evolutionary time that's very recent after the hybridization event and there are still a lot of possible ways to further uh, evolve. So the ho the possibility of the host jump is there then. Um, so it's it's a host jump. Yeah, it's a bit. We don't really. It's not a hundred percent thing of that's yeah that uh, it, it, it infects a very different host. I think there's a brassica specialist, and I think generally we see less Bertillon dali on the brassica species, and I think. The hybridization might be that the hybrid for Tsunomisporum sees an opportunity there to colonize this group of uh, plant species and then evolve further on these species and get more specialized. Sure. But it's all hypothetic, uh, hypothetical, of course. Yeah. And then uh, regarding the population, um, I like we haven't done a population study including the Canadian samples, but using this um, genome sequence um, from Canada, we saw very little genomically then, very little differences with the strain that we have from uh, the UK. And also within the A1, uh, D1 uh, hybrid lineage, um, my experience at least is that I see very little strain differences regarding the pathogenicity. They all seem to have a very similar kind of, um, yeah, virulence towards um, different, yeah, also uh, rape uh, cold device. All right, uh, this next question, I wonder if um, maybe Becky could take a stab at it first. Um, so the comment here is, I wonder if we should consider Verticillium longisporum a seed or seedling pathogen based on seeing the difference in emergence. Do you have any comments, Becky? Uh, yes, based on my study, I found the uh, emergence has been largely affected by the uh, verticillium stripe, like verticillium longisporium, but we don't know whether the uh, seed quality or uh, whether if it's seed born or not. So uh, for right now, I would say it, we wouldn't consider it as a ceiling pathogen right now. Uh, this next question uh, for Dr. Borhan. Uh, what is the benefit of sequencing for various isolates? Is there a known difference in the genomic structure or pathogenicity of the isolates uh, Verticillium longisporum reflected in the strain level? Um, that's what we, we don't know. I mean, uh, definitely, we need to do to do those kind of study in terms of uh, Canadian isolate collection. Uh, one, uh, the, the most immediate practical uh, uh, usage of having a genome sequence is that, uh, for for example, for black leg, we have developed this CAS marker that we can genotype uh, um, black leg and uh, uh, saying that what what are the different genotypes. 
So that is due to that we have a large collection of black leg, we um, sequence large collection of black leg, also the AV lens genes were known, and we use uh, uh, SNPs to differentiate isolate. In terms of Veltrusian uh, angiosperm, I think the one, one, one immediate benefit and practical benefit could be that we could differentiate isolate based on these SNPs. That's, that's what could be also in term, but in terms of uh, it's uh, uh, in terms of uh, biology of the pathogen, uh, we don't know really how much difference are there between this this isolate and, for example, if the, if the isolate if there is an isolate that is less virulent, it would be interesting to see that it is due to loss of part of the genome. Is it due to, for example, losing a mini chromosome if there is some uh, such a thing? Uh, yeah. And yeah, so I think it it could also provide information of the biology of the virulence when we have the sequence, why some isolate are less virulent and for some are more virulent. All right. Um, is that late proliferation of verticillium on straight cut varieties contributing to yield loss? Or is it just an opportunistic characteristic of verticillium continuing on the maturing or desiccating tissue? Yeah, we don't want it, this being just, a, it's not a straight cut hybrid. It's not something in the genetics. It's totally just the environment and that those um, hybrids that are left to straight cut are left in the field longer in the season. Um, that's the only only reason why. So anything left later on is at risk. And, and that's why we see lots of really severe symptoms when we have delayed harvests. So think back a few years when we had rain most of September, um, those fields were really hard hit by vertices when they were being harvested in October. So it's, it's just a, a, a length. So length and maturity would mean a lot more over um, the, the suitability for a straight cut or not. And so if you are seeing verticillium stripe symptoms, do you think it's better to get in there and swath before you, if you leave it too long, you might see more shelling out? Um, not being a researcher, I won't really comment on that, but field wise, you have the potential to stop further spread of it. So um, something that we, we should be looking at and, and seeing if there is that possibility to slow it. Um, similar kind of comments that we have with sclerotinia, right? When we're seeing really severe, you're better to knock it down, but then you have the risk of, of creating more of it within that swath. So um, another research question to add to the list. A uh, question for Dr. DePotter. Given your understanding of the evolution of this new pathogen, what are your thoughts of its genetic potential to produce newer strains, pathotypes, races that may have increased virulence on B. napis and the different potential resistant genes? Um, my current experience um, is mainly with A1v1 and my, my experience is very homogenous. So um, I expect that if evolutionary that after the hybridization, I expect that the hybridization is relatively recent, I would say, um, but it has a huge potential. But then we speak over a long period of time. This is, yeah, decennia, centuries where this evolution um, needs to happen, it has to occur. Um, the only thing I would say it has a lot of potential. So, um, but, the diversity wise, I would say it's not a hugely diverse uh, pathogen. And only speaking about the A1B1 lineage, of course, because the other ones are not really thoroughly studied. Um, can samples of seedlings, uh, one to four leaf stage, be sent to the lab for testing if we feel we are identifying early symptoms? Uh, yes, that could be done. At, yeah, based, on, based on the molecular markers. Could be done, yeah. yeah. It, um, it'll depend on the lab, I guess, would be a key part and, and where those samples are going to. Not all um, provincial diagnostics labs would have the capability to run those types of tests. So, Right, that's probably something we can look into and, and let everybody know when we we send you out uh, 
the video recording. So, um, what harvest method provides the best yield, swathing or straight cut? Any comments for anyone? Well, this come back. It's all about timing. Thank you. Uh, has there been any evidence that the pathogen forms canidia under field conditions? Could this contribute to longer distance dispersal? Are we talking about microsclerotia? Oh, because it produces microsclerotia, just like uh, sclerotinia produces uh, sclerotia. So uh, definitely microsclerotia being in such an abundance in even a small piece of uh, a piece of stem, uh, it uh, automatically constitutes for long uh, dispersal um, because of uh, the minute size and its uh, 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 availability within the soil. And also because it is so um, uh, less in weight, just like the club root pathogen, it can move with machinery and with other equipment that is being used in the farm as well. So if you want to compare, uh, Becky did a wonderful job of comparing black leg to uh, um, uh, verticillium. Thank you, Becky, for doing all that. I always love to see a PhD student or a graduate student making presentations. So thank you for that. Um, the, um, the club root would be the most uh, uh, comparable organism to uh, the uh, the uh, verticillium when it comes to distribution because of its weight and the way club root is even more minute, but at the same time, the, the method of spread is very similar in both. All right. Um, can we expect a correlation between resistance to blackleg and reaction to verticillium stripe? My postdoc is looking at that right at this point. Uh, so uh, we are working with uh, certain resistance genes uh, in the canola, and uh, we are looking at whether there is a correlation, but it's really too early for us to make any uh, uh, comment on that at the moment. All right, um, this one um, is for Becky and then anybody else that may wanna answer afterwards. Uh, I'm curious about the potential seedling damage. How did you inoculate the soil and could this step have reduced seedbed quality? Do others in the panel think potential seedling damage is worth for further study? So uh, I inoculated my uh, research experiment using the green inoculum not the uh, stroll like infected uh, canola residue. So uh, along with the seeds, so I uh, add inoculum into the cedar. Um, I'm not sure about the seed bad quality, but uh, potentially we see uh, ceiling damages. So I think it was like doing research about that. Any other comments from anyone else? I can add to that. Um, I, so again, uh, the work that my postdoc is doing at the moment, uh, I should identify the postdoc, Dr. Arya Dolabadarian, who is in the audience. Um, so he's looking at um, this interaction when we look at uh, black leg and uh, uh, verticillium with resistance genes incorporated into the mix. Uh, we are particularly looking at how, uh, whether it is a synergistic effect of the two pathogens, whether it is uh, uh, one pathogen uh, giving an opportunity to the other. So we are inoculating backwards and forwards of the two organisms uh, to see whether uh, any of these uh, two pathogens have uh, advantage uh, to cause more disease on the canola plant because of the presence of the other. So 
So again, the work is going on, but we don't have the results to share. <laughs> All right. Um, so if anyone hears of any um, products out there that are claiming that they reduce or eradicate verticillium stripe at root intersection, do you guys have any comments on that or know of any work that's being done on that? Um, <laughs> Certainly we don't have any work on that. Um, it, it's something where there, there's products that are being marketed that way um, and, and are in the early stages of really exploring it. So it's something that'll come up. Um, like I said, we've gone through a bunch of the funded work here in Canada. So we haven't uh, been addressing those types of things yet. Um, I know there's been some product claims out of, of, of Europe and maybe um, Dr. DePotter can address some of those that are, are supposed to be working as a seed treatment or a protective within the soil. Um, we see the same thing in club root. We're just not quite there yet to have a solid management tool or tactic behind some of these products. Yeah, sorry. I also, it's not my specialty and yeah, I have no further information about that. Fair enough. Um, so there is another question here about any comments on possible interaction with black leg disease. And Becky, I think you... Um, probably addressed a lot of a lot of that, um, but I'm also wondering maybe um, we see a lot more black leg in uh, plants or fields that maybe have had some environmental damage, um, in particular hail. Do we see any correlation like that with verticillium? Uh, based on my research, because uh, in the year of 2020 it was really wet, so I didn't expect I could see any verticillium stripe symptoms in my field, even though I inoculate both black leg and verticillium uh, inoculum together, but I still could see uh, verticillium stripe symptoms on the stem, although it is a wet year. And um, uh, last year, like 2021 was a really dry year. So I didn't expect I could see a uh, black leg for sure, but I still do see a uh, black leg in the field. So I think for um, black leg and verticillium, they could interact interact with each other and uh, environmental conditions do not really uh, affect both like based on my experiment so yeah that's all okay um, and this is a question for any of you are there any species in the verticillium genus where the sexual stage has been observed if not, are there any thoughts in the expert community what the sexual species might be, or does this truly not exist? Uh, so it hasn't been observed. Um, so it has mating type genes. So it maybe had the, um, the possibility to mate, but it has never been observed. And yeah, we're a bit, I'm a bit skeptical about if it still happens because you see about the genome evolution, there's so much recombination and there's so much reshuffling. And then if you would need to have like a successful meiosis, to my opinion, I think like the, the, the genome structure is so diverse between certain strains that it would be very difficult or it needs to be with lineages, which is structurally very similar. But we see so many structural variation that I think meiosis doesn't happen or happens only in very yeah, small incidences. Justine, did you have a comment? Okay. <laughs> um, does voluntary canola at the one to two leaf stage contribute to the disease? I was playing with buttons. Um, so <laughs> for the voluntary canola, um, yes, it, they definitely could. Um, that's why just managing any sort of brassica species within the field and um, becomes important because they all act as hosts for this pathogen. Um, one kind of really key thing in, in with working with verticillium stripe being a soil borne disease, even on those off years where you're not growing canola, that inoculum remains in the field. It can be spread around, blown around and targeting any brassica plants, um, even though you're in a soybean crop, for example.
Okay, and we're in the last few minutes here. So I guess I'll um, ask one last question uh, before we wrap things up. Um, so I'm wondering if each of you would be able to provide a take home message or just like your a last thought to the attendees uh, that are watching. So maybe we'll start with uh, Jasper. Um, yeah, I would say take home message. Um, it is a hybrid, which makes it very interesting from a genome um, evolutionary point. And we we'll just say it has a lot of potential um, to evolve. And I think it would be very interesting to do, I don't know, in how many decades to resequence a genome and then see what happened in this, I don't know, let's say 50 year time span. How does the hybrid genome still look like? Uh, how about Becky? Yeah, um, so um, I think next time if you see um, black leg or verdicinum stripe in your field and you will have hardly time to identify either uh, if it's black leg or verdicinum stripe, you could just do a longitudinal cut. So that will help you. Of course, uh, horizontal cut will help you to do identify whether if it's black leg, like the black cross section area or if it's the uh, verdicinum stripe, the gray cross-section area, but if you are still confused, you could just do a longitudinal cut to identify whether if it is black leg or verdicinum stripe. So I think that for now, that is the most effective, effective way for people just go into the field to do identification. Uh, let's go to Hussein. Yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, be, uh, being a soil borne pathogen, it's uh, very challenging to uh, control the disease. And uh, although we don't have data on the, really its impact on yield. And uh, so I think we should still take this seriously, especially because it's soil borne. And if it, it should probably Im implement some of the management that we have learned from club root to uh, sort of be more vigilant about the disease and its spread. So that's, that's what I can say. Uh, Talantha. I'm thinking how you could uh, finish a plant pathology related uh, conference with a positive note. And uh, maybe I should try that. So I think the best news that uh, Canadians have is that our genotypes do have resistance. And uh, that would be something that uh, we can look forward to, uh, increasing that resistance with the right genetics, increasing the opportunities to screen and find the right resistance for us to move forward with and uh, mitigate the disease before it becomes another black leg. And Justine. Leaving the last word, um, this entire workshop um, has been so great to to attend and listen into. So I appreciate all of the, the work coming from here in Canada and, and also in Europe um, on this topic. And, and I think overall, as a canola industry here in Canada, um, the work and the progress that has been made on verticillium stripe in such a short amount of time is just so phenomenal, phenomenal to see. And, and this doesn't happen without great teamwork, right? We've addressed um, issues on the ground level, you know, concerns of growers. Um, we've been able to put research projects in place to help answer this. And every year we're getting more and more information to help battle this in such a short amount of time since its introduction here in Canada. So I guess just a, a kudos to the, the canola industry um, and to all the partners to really move the needle on this on this topic and this disease. Um, and I'm excited to know that we're, we've got it handled and we're moving in the right direction to hopefully minimize this disease here in Canada. Excellent. Thank you all. Um, so I noticed that there are still some more questions. Um, and so what we're going to do is um, collect all of those questions that uh, are left unanswered, and we're going to circulate it to circulate all of them to the uh, presenters. Um, and we will be sending you all uh, a summary of those uh, questions and answers as well. So I want to end by thanking everybody for participating this, in this morning's workshop. And thanks again to all of our presenters. Uh, you will receive an email with the survey link at the end of this workshop. 
Uh, please take a few minutes to provide feedback. We use the results to plan future events and identify research needs within the canola industry. To find more information on verticillium stripe, please visit the Canola Council of Canada's Canola Encyclopedia. Or to see details of the research presented today, please visit the Canola Research Hub or the research result database on the SAS Canola and Alberta Canola websites. If you have further questions about today's presentations, I encourage you to reach out to us directly. We're always open to hearing farmer feedback on research challenges, priorities, and investments. So thank you everyone and have a great afternoon.